Ancient Greece, the birthplace of Western civilization. For over 1,000 years, this strong and charismatic people devised the most advanced technological feats the world had ever seen. So you have the appearance of a new generation of thinkers, and you have a reason to build things, to understand nature, to create technology. Feats of engineering so amazing, the ancients believed they had been built by the gods. One thing that we should really wonder is how on earth these people managed to lift these truly huge, gigantic stones. These technological wonders were fueled by leaders whose thirst for greatness united a people and launched them to the heights of empire. But this brilliant burst of culture and creativity would fall victim to savage battles that pitted brother against brother. A duel to the death that would lead to the end of a golden age. September 480 BC, morning breaks over the island of Salamis and the thin mile-wide strait that separates it from mainland Greece. The calm sea provides no hint of the great battle that is about to begin here. By day's end, the Mediterranean will be flowing red with blood. At stake is nothing less than the future and independence of Greece a country of islands and city-states which lie just outside the reach of the greatest empire in the known world, Persia. Persia was the world superpower of its day, enormously wealthy, enormously self-confident, the greatest multi-ethnic, multicultural empire the world had seen. A Persian invasion force of epic proportions is on the horizon. As many as 700 ships carrying 150,000 warriors determined to add Greece to their empire. But one Greek is poised and ready for battle. His name is Themistocles, an Athenian admiral and statesman who has been preparing for this moment for years. But going up against Persia, the world's greatest superpower of the time would be no day at the beach for Themistocles. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. First of all, the Greek naval fleet was outnumbered two to one. Second of all, Themistocles faced the almost insurmountable problem of trying to unite a completely disparate and contentious group of warriors into one command. You see, the good news about the civic development of ancient Greece was the city-state. Each of these city-states was sort of a self-contained, self-reliant mini-country within Greece. But the bad news about the civic development of ancient Greece was the city-state. Because inasmuch as each of these city-states sort of spoke the same lingo, worshipped the same gods, there was really no sense of a national unity. And their only priority was their own particular regional and cultural agenda. At best, they didn't get along. At worst, they were violently at each other's throats. If there was someone who could pull the Athenians together, it was Themistocles, a man who didn't come from the aristocratic ranks and wasn't ashamed to let his fellow Athenians know it. He was always an outsider, and he saw himself as an outsider, and he uh, prided himself on his lack of polish. Uh, he said that he might not know how to tune a lyre uh, or to sing well, but he knew all you needed to know to make a city great and free. Themistocles was no stranger to facing the Persians in battle. Ten years earlier, a smaller Persian force had invaded Greece for the first time, and fought the Athenians and her allies at Marathon. Now, Themistocles would bring that experience to Salamis and focus his strategy on a fatal flaw he detected in the Persian war machine, their navy. He understood that the water was not the Persians' natural element. Persia was a land power. In fact, Persian religion considered salt water to be demonic. Themistocles wanted the Greeks to build a navy unlike any the world had ever seen. Immediately, work began at breakneck speed to build a fleet of 200 triremes, the deadliest ship in the ancient world. 
Triarium's about 130 feet long. It's light and sleek, and it's tipped with a wooden ram covered in bronze at the water level, and that is the offensive weapon of the Triarium. Might think of the Triarium actually as a guided missile. The Triarium consisted of 170 rowers on three separate levels, 62 on the top level, 54 in the middle, and 54 on the bottom. On the lowest level, rowers were seated so deep in the ship that their oar ports were just 18 inches above the waterline. So you have a ship, a wooden ship, that is powered from the oars. It can go up to eight knots, or nine knots, which is an amazing speed for the ancient world. And it can attack like a missile. And the rowers, of course, have to learn how to work as a team. They have to learn to row together in unison, which is an easy thing to begin to do, but a very difficult thing to master. The Mysticles fleet of triremes was finished in just a few years and in the nick of time. In the spring of 480 BC, Persia launched a massive invasion of Greece. The Mysticles knew that the Persian fleet outnumbered the combined Greek fleet by almost two to one, so he devised a simple yet cunning plan to keep the Greeks together and level the odds. He had to turn a disadvantage into an advantage, the fact that he had fewer ships than the Persians. So he had to lure the Persians, if you like, into such a battleground that they could not advance the whole ranks. So he can actually concentrate their power and strike it. So the best place that he could do that was at the Straits of Salamis. Themistocles would devise a ruse to lure the Persian fleet into the narrow straits of Salamis. Themistocles was a very cunning man, a great trickster. Themistocles knew that the Persians preferred to win battles through diplomacy, through intimidation, and through buying traders. On the eve of the battle, Themistocles sent a trusted servant across the straits to the Persian camp. The servant played the role of a traitor, telling the Persian king the Greeks were in disarray, and if the Persians sent their ships in the night, they could surprise the Greek navy in the morning. The Persians took the bait. So at dawn, the Persians discovered to their shock that the Greek fleet, instead of being about to flee, was getting into battle formation, and that they, the Persians, would have to fight. So it was a perfect setup of a battle by Themistocles. Now 200 triremes, powered by 34,000 Greek rowers, formed into a line. There was no room for the Persians to maneuver in the narrow straits. Themistocles had sprung the perfect trap. The attacks raged all day long as the Greek triremes encircled the Persian ships, then pounded them with their forward rams. And the Persian officers died in unusually high proportions. The battle was so confused, chaotic, and unnerving that at the end of the day, the Greeks weren't even sure that they had won. But thousands of lifeless enemy bodies on the shores of Salamis revealed a decisive Greek victory. Some historical sources claim the Persians lost as many as 200 ships to the Greeks' 40. Any Persians that didn't drown were slaughtered by Greek soldiers waiting on shore. Had the Greeks not won the Battle of Salamis, the Greek civilization or ancient Greece, its values that we all share to, in our today's world, may never have been there. After the stunning victory at Salamis, Themistocles was hailed as a hero, but his personal ambitions and greed began to add to his many political enemies. It was only a matter of time before the rage of the assembly boiled over. Athens at this time had a practice called ostracism, an annual unpopularity contest in which the people would vote for the politician who they felt was most disruptive, most dangerous to the political process, and they would exile him for 10 years. In 471 BC, Themistocles was ostracized. In a stunning irony, he was forced to embrace the enemy he had fought so hard to defeat. He would never see Athens again. Amazingly, he was forced to flee to Persia itself, 
where he found refuge, and he ended his life speaking Persian, working as an administrator for the Persian king, helping the Persians govern Western Asia Minor. Themistocles had played his part in an epic story of Greek power and achievement that looked to a glorious past for inspiration. The legendary tales of the gods and heroes told in epics like the Iliad and the Odyssey. The stories may be myth, but the engineering achievements of these Greek ancestors were very real and still stand today. In the Greek city-state of Sparta, boys began their military training at age seven. By 1300 BC, a people speaking an early form of the Greek language had inhabited large portions of mainland Greece. They were known as the Mycenaeans, and for years their wars and scandals, exploits and achievements became the stuff of legend and laid the foundation of Greek civilization. Their capital city of Mycenae was surrounded by a massive citadel built over the course of 150 years. According to myth, it was from this city that the Mycenaeans were led by a king named Agamemnon, whose epic struggles were written down by the 8th century BC poet Homer in two of history's most famous tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the Iliad was something like the Bible for ancient Greeks. It contained a moral story. It told you how you should live. It described gods, it described religion, but also described people, it described situations. It gave ideals that you should look upon. The tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey have become some of the most famous in history. The abduction of Helen by Paris, Agamemnon's 10 year siege of Troy, and the giant wooden horse which the Greeks used to enter Troy and destroy the city. Although Agamemnon's exploits during the Trojan War may have been heroic, his return home to Mycenae was far from a hero's welcome. He was murdered by his own wife. Scholars have debated for centuries whether or not Homer actually penned the Iliad and the Odyssey, or whether he just collected the folk tales of song, or whether he had anything to do with them at all. But if the ancient Greeks came back today, they'd scoff at this pithy harangue. Because of the ancient Greeks, Homer wasn't just some top 40s folk singer, nor was he the best-selling hack writer of some piece of pulp fiction. Homer was an historian. And these legends weren't the bedtime stories to be whispered to the kitties before the oil lamps were blown out. These were accountable facts. This is what is left of Mycenae, the capital city of which Homer writes and where many, including me, would like to believe that Agamemnon really ruled. These ruins show us that not only were these early Greeks master builders, but they were capable of some amazing engineering feats. As you approach Mycenae, first thing, of course, that you will see is the fortification walls, which are very impressive. And immediately you have this feeling of Awesome. The citadel walls of Mycenae are buttressed by stone blocks which weigh up to 10 tons apiece. They were engineered with such precision that each stone fit perfectly in place to its adjacent block. But for awe-inspiring visuals, nothing in Mycenae comes closer than the colossal main entrance to the citadel, the Lion's Gate. This is the Lion's Gate, the main gate to the citadel of Mycenae. It is one of the more stunning structures of all of early antiquity. It is an imposing piece of symbolism. It is an imposing piece of engineering. Two lions standing fully upright, their paws on the base of a column. Their heads, which are missing, will be turning outward. Anybody approaching this gate would know that Mycenae stood for one thing, power. 
Structurally, the gate looks to be a standard engineering practice of post and lintel construction. These vertical elements here, these massive piers, are the posts supporting the lintel, the horizontal element, which weighs about 12 tons. But it is above the gate where the lions live that the engineers took it one step further. If you look at this triangle of indented stones right by the lions, it develops an element that we call the corbelled arch. Suppose you have these four stones, and instead of piling them up, you try to create an opening from that side, and you steal a little bit of space by putting them this way. This is cobbling. If we are a little bit more ambitious because this is not sufficiently large, and we try to displace further these stones, still in cobbling, then we are running this risk that this is falling down. So what is the little trick? It's simple. You start putting counter weight behind each of these corbelled stones. Now, this triangle, first of all, we should say that this is a true Mycenaean innovation. This is something that we see for the first time, most probably worldwide. Uh, so in that sense, we are looking at something that's very innovative, very new. The Mycenaean engineers took the corbelled arch one step further. They applied the idea to create a revolutionary interior space called a corbelled dome. The dome was used in only one kind of construction, a tomb. Like the Egyptians, the Mycenaeans built incredible structures to house their leaders in the afterlife. These tombs are called tholos. Their construction departed from anything the Mycenaean engineers had ever done before. I mean, the circular form is completely absent in the architectural minds of the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans work with straight lines and, and right angles. So the circle is just for this kind of structure. So that makes the impression and the symbolism of the circle as related to death even stronger. Building a tholos was a giant engineering feat. The first step would have been to hollow out the side of a hill. So they dug this trench, and this trench would form the dromos, which means in Greek road or way. In this case, it's a walkway to the tomb, and it's flanked on each side by these beautiful almond stones set in lengthwise and edgewise. Now, 3,200 years ago in 1200 BC, a visitor approaching would walk down this dromos, and then he would be confronted by an unbelievably magnificent and stunning sight, this massive doorway. The doorway would be flanked by two fantastic columns carved out of solid green marble with zigzag and spiral designs going all the way up. Each one of these massive stones is two and a half feet tall, and there are 33 rings of these stones laid out in a conical shape. Now, each layer of stone is laid over the lower one in a sort of protruding fashion. That's what we mean by the corbelled style. And then they're shaved down to make it all very smooth. In order for this structure to be stable, you need a constant pressure from outwards, inwards. Very much like a barrel, where you need this band, this metallic band around to keep the rings together. This pressure comes from the addition of earth. As they build, they add earth from around and quite a lot of earth, and there comes a point when they have finished the beehive structure inside. At the same time, they have built a whole earthen mound on top. Around 1100 BC, this early Greek civilization suddenly and mysteriously disintegrated and disappeared. There's lots of theories about that. I think the most dominant one is new tribes, new barbarian tribes came from uh, the steppes and they attacked uh, the civilizations of Egypt, they attacked the civilization of Mesopotamia, causing disruption in the trade routes. But that became their fall. With the fall of Mycenae, Greece entered a dark age. Over four centuries, its culture fell into a deep slumber. Then, in the 8th century BC, individual city-states began to develop and flourish, each one forging its own identity, competing for economic, military, 
and engineering prominence. One Greek island in particular, Samos, would see the construction of one of the most amazing engineering feats seen in the ancient world, moving mountains to bring water to the people. The ancient Greeks believed Homer, the 8th century poet who wrote the Iliad and Odyssey, was actually blind. Sparta, Athens, Corinth, Thebes. These are just a few of the more than 100 city-states that emerged all around Greece 400 years after the disappearance of the Mycenaean civilization. Before the advent of democracy in Greece, many of these city-states were led by a single ruler called a tyrant in ancient Greek. Around 540 BC, a tyrant named Polycrates came to rule over the island city-state of Samos in the eastern Aegean Sea. He was quite a player on the international scene. He made uh, tactical alliances, not just with the Persians, but also, for example, with the Egyptians. He was an ambitious figure. Polycrates saw that the path to power for an island like Samos lay through the sea. He built a fleet of 100 triremes, terrorizing neighboring city-states and taxing ships that passed through the surrounding waters. Under Polycrates, uh, Samos, his home island, became the dominant sea power, and that was the basis of his wealth and power. With his newly found riches, Polycrates built up defensive walls around his capital city and set about to solve a problem that plagued many cities in the arid Mediterranean climate, drinking water. Samos was a very, very important and powerful city. They were needing a lot of water, and they were short of water. There was a plentiful spring available, but it was separated from the city by the 900-foot-high Mount Castro. Somehow, Polycrates and his engineers had to figure out how to connect the city and the spring. Running an aqueduct around the mountain was not an option. You could construct a water supply system around the mountain, but the first thing a besieging enemy would do to cut off that water line, and uh, there you are with your wonderful uh, fortification, with your wonderful new walls, and you're drying out. The solution required thinking outside the box. Polycrates turned to an engineer named Eupolinos. Eupolinos came up with a solution that literally meant moving a mountain, a tunnel running straight through Mount Castro. It would be a huge project and a lengthy one. The time needed for such tunneling should be enormous. Therefore, the decision was taken to drive tunnels from both sides. This is a mathematical and a technical problem. Like the engineers of the modern-day channel under the English Channel, Eupolinos dug tunnels from each side of the mountain until they met in the middle. To succeed, Eupolinos would have to be sure that each tunnel started at the same vertical height on opposite sides of the mountain. The tunnels also had to match up on a horizontal plane, otherwise they would pass each other like ships in the night. Without sophisticated surveying equipment, it was a remarkable challenge for an engineer to take on. One theory involves a short walk around a large mountain. By forging a path from the spring to the city in short perpendicular lines, Eupolinos could measure each small length in order to calculate two sides of a right triangle. With two known sides of the triangle, the hypotenuse became the path of the tunnel through the mountain. What made this prodigious feat of engineering even more amazing is that it involved not one tunnel, but two. The main tunnel was dug at a height and length of about six feet by six feet, but was only used as a workspace to dig a second tunnel, adjacent and below the main one. That would serve as the actual aqueduct. While the work tunnel was dug on a straight plane, the aqueduct tunnel was dug along the side and below. This second tunnel needed to be angled on a slight gradient to allow the water to flow gently downward toward the city. It was a matter of life and death in the dark and dangerous bowels of the mountain. Once they were in the mountains, 
The difficulties must have been paramount because rock may be moving in unpredictable ways, water may all of a sudden splash up and cause havoc. This was uh, probably a constant danger. Apart from that, it was dark and needed to be illuminated and you needed to constantly know where you are in order to keep your line straight. After slight adjustments, the two crews met in the middle almost exactly where Eupolinos had originally determined. The floors of each tunnel connected with only 24 inches difference between them, a discrepancy of less than one-eighth of a percent of the tunnel's 3,500-foot length. This stunning engineering achievement may have been the shining moment of Polycrates' reign, but his political fortunes would not prove so bright. The Persian governor on the coast of uh, Asia Minor decided that that degree of autonomy that Polycrates enjoyed was unsuitable to the development of Persian power, and he was arrested um, and uh, brutally tortured and crucified. Polycrates was just one tyrant among many who ruled the city-states of ancient Greece between 800 BC and 500 BC. The rule of the few over the many was the only form of government humans had ever known, but that was about to change. The city-state of Athens was going to change the course of world history. The visionary leader who would make it happen was named Pericles. His legacy would be an everlasting monument on the Athenian Acropolis that rose above the clouds. An amazing piece of precision engineering called the Parthenon. The word encyclopedia comes from two Greek words meaning a circle of learning. In 480 BC, when Themistocles defeated the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, he saved not only Athens, but also its young democracy, which had been born about 25 years earlier. For Athens, the age of the single ruler was over. Athens was rich in military might, treasure, technology, and ideas. She was poised for her golden age, and one man would take her there. His name was Pericles, a democrat and enlightened intellectual who encouraged the arts. But Pericles would also expand Athenian power through any means, including threats, bribery, and naked force. Pericles came from one of the old aristocratic families of Athens, so he came from the kind of family background in which a career of political and military leadership was expected. His rise to power began when he was elected as a young man to the position of strategos, one of 10 such men who commanded the army and set foreign policy. A natural at politics and a gifted orator, Pericles was soon Athens' most influential and powerful statesman. Pericles was the typical political animal, if you like. This guy was a politician. He uh, was able to speak and convince. He was completely dedicated to what he did. Pericles became leader of Athens in 461 BC. Thanks to the fleet of triremes Themistocles had built, the Athenian navy held unrivaled power in the eastern Mediterranean. But despite the defeat of the Persian Empire at Salamis, the threat of another invasion was always looming. In 478 BC, Athens, together with the city-states of the Aegean, formed a mutual defense alliance called the Delian League, the ancient world's version of NATO. By 450 BC, Athens has become the undisputed leader of the Delian League, which is nothing more than a money faucet for the city-state. But Pericles, as undisputed leader of Athens, finds ways to put this money to the best possible use by building massive public structures that best reflect the grandeur and magnificence of Athens. Now, legend has it that Poseidon, god of the sea, and Athena, goddess of wisdom, each came to the Acropolis to compete for the patronage of the city, the outcome to be decided by the inhabitants. 
Poseidon struck the ground with his trident, and up popped a spring. Athena struck the ground with her spear, and up came an olive tree, which not only suggested sustenance for the Greeks, but a possible outlet for a commercial venue. Thus, Athena became the patron goddess of the city. Over the centuries, there were several temples to Athena, most of them destroyed. But we leave it to Pericles to give the world the most remarkable piece of architecture in all of Greek antiquity, the Parthenon. Pericles decided to rebuild the Parthenon on the Acropolis, using the crumbling foundations of an older Athenian temple. It would take thousands of laborers and skilled craftsmen to create this magnificent temple. And it would cost more than any building the Greeks had ever engineered, 30 million drachmas. In our terms, billions of dollars. That's an amazing, an amazing amount. But keep in mind, that was a huge uh, state enterprise. Construction on the gargantuan building project began in 447 BC. The Parthenon was to be about two-thirds the length of a football field. Its outer dimensions, 228 feet long by 101 feet wide. The first challenge was to cleave the marble from a mountain quarry 10 miles away. In all, about 30,000 tons of the fine white stone would be needed. In the quarry, workers used the natural cracks of the stone to separate giant marble slabs from the mountainside. The first step is to locate these cracks and calculate if this piece of marble is sufficient for my specific purpose. The second step is to put within these cracks both horizontal cracks and vertical cracks wedges, iron wedges. Why? Because an enormous energy was given by hammering all these wedges simultaneously so that the brittleness of the material makes further cracking. Once the giant slabs were ready, gangs of men used levers, ropes, and pulleys to maneuver the marble and prepare the stone for transportation to the Acropolis. But accidents often happened. There was an enormous risk that this big uh, block would slide further on, killing people underneath. But cutting and transporting the marble from the side of the mountain was only half the battle in the construction of the Parthenon. Engineers now had to answer the question of how to lift these 10-ton marble behemoths and erect the greatest temple the world had ever seen. No medals were awarded in the ancient Olympics. A winner received an olive wreath on his head. July, 447 BC. Construction began on a magnificent temple on the Athenian Acropolis. The Parthenon was the vision of Pericles, a dynamic and ambitious leader who would take Athens into a golden age never before seen in ancient Greece. It was a statement. We are the most powerful city. We are the cauldron of democracy and free thinking. We have the best people, we have the best army, the best navy, we are the leaders. The Parthenon would differ from most temples of the day, which consisted of a hexa-style construction, featuring six columns on one end and 13 on the side. The Parthenon would be a larger octa style with eight by 17 columns. That makes the building very different because they all have basically the same proportions. When you make them larger, you simply scale up everything. To make it wider was to give it an extra dimension. The columns provide the main support for the structure. Each column consisted of 11 separate drums stacked one on top of the other like checkers. They were carved so that they would perfectly fit when laid together in a column. To do this, the top of each drum was divided into four concentric circles, with each ring either smoothed or roughed out, depending on the amount of grip needed to interlock with the next drum. In the center of each drum, masons cut a rectangular notch 
measuring about four to six inches square and three to four inches deep. Carpenters then inserted wooden plugs into the notches, which served to align and center each drum with the one above it. The next challenge was in lifting the enormously heavy drums, especially those for the upper sections of the columns. A single column of the Parthenon could weigh between 63 and 119 tons. A crane is a, an extremely simple device. You have just a boom, and then you have a series of pulleys, which, as we know, uh, just give you the possibility of taking up a weight of, uh, say, 10 tons by pulling down only 100 kilos. Engineers attach the stone to the crane in one of several ways. The method most often used was to tie the end of the rope to the top part of a metal S-hook, fasten shorter ropes to the bottom of the hook, and then loop these around small protruding knobs called bosses that had been left uncut from the marble for this very purpose. Typically, four bosses would be left surrounding the drum or stone block, evenly distributing the force needed to hoist the object. The walls and closing interior spaces had to be laid down with extreme precision, since the builders did not use mortar. To hold the ends of each block together, Builders hollowed out the ends in a double T design. Then iron rods were inserted to clamp them together. After the columns and blocks were put in place, the bosses used to lift them were chipped off and smoothed over. There's a saying that there are no straight lines in the Parthenon. Now what's meant by this is that the architects incorporated a series of sort of optical illusions when they built it. It starts with the stairs, goes up through the columns, all the way up to the top of the building, the pediment, that triangular element at the top. So let's take a look at the stairs. They seem to be straight, but no, closer look, they bow in the center and they go back down at the end. Now this conceit, if you will, continues right up to the columns. This column is of the Doric order. There's no base. It seems to grow right up out of the stone. Each column has 20 flutes which makes the column sort of undulate as you look around it. And then the column bows out in the center and bows back up at the top. This is a process called entasis. Such long lines, which are more or less at the level of your horizon, tend to curve. So in order to um, extinguish this effect, they curve them the other way. So the result, again, is more harmonious and you see it as being straight. Because if it was all straight, perfect, right angles, then you will see it like that. The Parthenon's main function was to provide shelter for the monumental statue of Athena. Parthenon was an extremely expensive building, uh, but the statue inside of it was almost equal in cost to the building itself, if not even more expensive. Athena's statue was about 10, 11 meters high, that means 30 to 35 feet or so. And it was uh, of the materials gold and ivory. Hundreds of sculptors created lifelike figures that proved the craftsmanship wasn't simply in the engineering. The most famous carving in the decoration of the temple is the frieze running on the interior walls of the Parthenon. It was carved in a low relief, just inches off the stone, and depicts the Panathenia, a celebration to the goddess Athena held in Athens every four years. What survives on the, on the side of the Parthenon today are the white marble remains of the building. In antiquity, not only the sculptures, but also many other parts of the building were richly decorated with paint. But not every citizen was enthralled by the Parthenon. Some saw Pericles' pet project as an Athenian eyesore and simply a monument to his own glory. Now, many Athenians hated the Parthenon, the temples. They thought it was disgusting. They thought it was, it was terrible. Plato didn't like it at all. Uh, for many Athenians, when they saw in their holiest of holies, if you like, those new buildings coming up, buildings that had incorporated novelties, buildings that were making a break from the past. The whispers of discontent in Athens weren't limited to the Parthenon. 
As Pericles continued to expand Athens' domination, his rivals began to conspire against him. Soon they lashed out and attacked his close associates. At the top of the list was an elegant and educated woman named Aspasia, a member of the elite Hatairai social caste and Pericles' consort. The Tyrai were high-class courtesans, um, often compared, for example, to geishas in uh, J Japanese culture. The Tyrai moved in the top circles uh, in Athenian and Greek cultural life. In classical Athens, a woman's role lay under the dominion of men, but Aspasia was the exception to the rule. Pericles treated Aspasia as an equal, and his consort quickly became part of the Athenian elite. But they became a well-known couple, and to the sort of astonishment uh, and some scandal of the Athenian people, Pericles was even to be seen actually kissing Aspasia publicly. And of course, public displays of affection <laughs> were not anything that one expected to see in classical Athens. By 432, after nearly 15 years of construction, the Parthenon was completed. This temple to Athena did just what Pericles wanted. It advertised the power of Athens to the world. Ironically, the supremacy the Parthenon symbolized was already waning, and Athens' longtime enemy, Sparta, was on the rise. Once Athens had established this great alliance system, or as some people put it, this Athenian empire, and arguably that's what it became, the Spartans began more and more to look uh, askance, as it were, at the Athenians, and eventually, by the 430s, to feel threatened by the Athenians. In 431 BC, Sparta moved on Athens. For two long years, Athens held out against the Spartan siege. But Pericles' shining city was about to come under attack by an invisible enemy. After a couple of years, because of the overcrowding in the city of Athens, disease that seems to have come originally from the Near East uh, attacked the Athenian people. It's known as the Great Athenian Plague. Large numbers of Athenians died in this plague. Pericles, now in his early 60s, survived the plague, but was physically weakened and bore the brunt of the blame for the city's misfortune. In 429, with plague and war overshadowing his beloved city, Pericles died. The bloody and brutal conflict between Athens and Sparta, known as the Peloponnesian War, continued for another 25 years, until finally in 404 BC, Athens fell. With the end of the Peloponnesian War, the time of Pericles and the dominance of Athens was over. Great marvels of Greek culture and Greek engineering would live on. And the irony was that the two men, the two purveyors, of the fantastic legacy of classical age of Athens were not Athenians at all. The names of these two men would be synonymous not only with conquest, but with Hellenism, the spreading of the Greek ideal of culture and value throughout the world right on up to our own modern day. These two men were Philip II of Macedonia and his son, a man who would be the envy of every single general and emperor from Julius Caesar to Napoleon to George Patton. A man who would traverse most of his known world in his short 33 years, that student of Aristotle and self-proclaimed God, Alexander the Great. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. They were the outcasts of the Greek world, until one man would rise and take his people to the heights of empire. Alexander was one of history's great commanders. He was well aware that he lived in an age of innovation in Greek warfare. 
Alexander the Great employed the latest technology to conquer civilizations, transforming the lands from Egypt to India into a new Greek world. Greeks have conquered the known world, so they're exporting their way of life because they think it's the best way of life. It's the best way that any human can live. But there are no kingdoms without a king. And with Alexander's swift and stunning demise, his empire would crumble almost as quickly as it was built. BC, a long and bloody 27-year war has come to an end. Athens, its once dominant navy destroyed, is starved into submission at the hands of its arch rivals, the Spartans. The Athenian generals commanding the main Athenian fleet made a disastrous mistake that led to a great battle and a an terrible defeat for the Athenians at a place called Agos Potamoi. In the decades after Athens' demise, the city-states of Sparta and Thebes would vie for dominance of Greece. But in 359 BC, a 23-year-old from the remote northern Greek region of Macedonia became king, and within two decades would change the face of Greece. His name was Philip II. Macedon was a, a funny Greek state. It was always a bridesmaid and never a bride. It had lots of potential, both in manpower and natural resources, but it had never managed to get its act together. The Greeks of the city-states considered the tribal Macedonians barely civilized. Yet within 20 years, Philip had unified and transformed them into the most respected and feared military machine Greece had ever seen. Philip built Macedonia on two fronts, diplomacy and strength. He began by creating alliances with the surrounding city-states, while at the same time reinventing the Macedonian army, making soldiering a full-time and highly trained occupation. But the key to his new professional army was a corps of engineers that Philip organized to design and build new instruments and machines of war an innovation that changed forever how wars would be fought and won. The Macedonians were not considered real Greeks by the Hellenic city-states. They came from a tribe called the Macedoni, and they'd been fighting barbarians for so long that they were considered barbarians themselves. However, Philip II was no barbarian. Or if he was, he was the most brilliant barbarian the world had ever seen. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. The pillar of Philip's military strategy was his combination of cavalry with infantry. And the pillar of his infantry was a formation called the Phalanx, a rectangle group of foot soldiers that traveled very lightly at a marching speed few other armies could equal. The Phalanx had been a part of Greek warfare for hundreds of years. Now Philip would infuse it with a weapon never before seen on the battlefield. The innovation that Philip did was changing the shape of the phalanx and introducing this long uh, weapon called the sarissa. So the phalanx became like a huge tank. The sarissa was a nearly 18-foot-long spear that could devastate an enemy before its soldiers could use their swords or shorter spears in a counterattack. Basically, you plant the head of your pike against the guy and push him back. Uh, and the effect is a little bit like, you know, an adult when a kid tries to attack him and you put your hand on the kid's forehead and his little fists are swinging like this, but they can't reach you. That's what the pike uh, enables uh, Philip's infantry to do. Well-drilled, well-disciplined, and well-equipped soldiers gave the Macedonian phalanx the upper hand against traditional battle tactics. But it would be engineering technology that would ultimately make Philip's armies invincible. For much of their military history, the Greeks were not particularly good at siege craft. Beginning uh, around 400 BC or shortly afterwards, uh, the Greeks begin to take a quantum leap. The bow and arrow had been an instrument of warfare for thousands of years, but the bow's power was limited to an individual and the strength of his arm. 
One of the ancient Greeks' first innovations in military engineering was in designing a bow that harnessed more power from the entire human body than from the arms alone. The earliest weapons of siegecraft that the Greeks developed are essentially crossbows, and they're called belly shooters, gastra fetes. You had a much bigger thing that had a kind of U-shaped element at the end that you pressed against your abdomen, uh, and then you drew back the bow with both hands, pressing it with your torso at the same time, so you could create a much greater force of tension. The gastro fetes was a deadly improvement over the bow and arrow. But to truly overcome the armies of the world, Philip needed more power. In order to do even more damage, they need to come up with yet another generation of weapons. They need to invent what we might call the torsion catapult. The torsion catapult basically uh, creates springs by twisting sinews, or in some cases, horse hair, or in emergencies, even human hair. Uh, you create thick ropes of them and then twist them together. Greek engineers designed a device that acted as a belly shooter mounted on a platform. They called it the oxabelles, or bolt shooter. Instead of using the body for power, the torsion created by the oxabelles came from twisting ropes to an explosive level of tension. There's an enormous stored force because the sinews want to spring back and release that tension, but they're held. Uh, and inserted into this spring is a bar. And you then pull that bar back, increasing the already great tension. And then when the bars are released, uh, they spring back with enormous force. Uh, and rapidity compared to the old uh, bow flexion system. Distance no longer protected enemy soldiers from a sudden and bloody death. When fired, the oxabelles could pierce the shields and armor of an enemy nearly a quarter of a mile away, giving birth to a term that we still use today, catapult. The neat thing about the word catapult is that it means skin penetrator. You can see our word pelt, like an animal skin, in the Greek catapult, goes through the skin. With his weapons of war, Philip was unstoppable against the other Greek city-states. By 338 BC, Philip's victory over Athens and Thebes made him the undisputed master of Greece. But it was Philip's actions after the battle that would indicate how the Macedonians would rule the lands they conquered, despite their barbaric reputation. Philip and his son Alexander, who's only 18 years old, defeat a coalition of Thebans and Athenians at the Battle of Coronia in 338 BC. And then Philip does a remarkable thing. He lets all the Athenians go, go back home. Then he calls together a council at Corinth, invites all of the city-states. He's got to cloak his power in some sort of diplomacy. And he tells all the city-states, you can groove. It's all going to be the same as it was before. He could have scorched the earth, just like Genghis Khan a few centuries later. But he didn't. Why? We've got to remember that the Greeks thought of the Macedonians as no better than a bunch of thugs. And the Macedonians didn't care much for the Greeks either. But Philip had had his taste of the Hellenic ideal during his time at Thebes. And as a king, he invited Greek philosophers and teachers to come to Macedonia. His entire court spoke Athenian Greek. Philip didn't want to destroy Greece. He wanted to be Greece. He was like the nerd at the back of the class who wanted to join the frat party, become one of the cool guys, albeit a little bit tougher. In his moment of triumph, led by Macedon, he was beginning, he was preparing to carry out his life's ambition, which was to invade the Persian Empire. He would never get there. Philip would meet an untimely demise at the hands of the ultimate insider. Just before Philip began his Persian conquest, he held a public celebration. As he marched alone ahead of his entourage to prove he had no one to fear, a bodyguard suddenly rushed forward and plunged a dagger into his chest. The man who had put Greece on the map was dead at 46. Was he a lone assassin or was there a bigger plot? 
We can never know for sure because while he, the assassin was trying to escape, he was uh, mowed down by Philip's guards. Philip's dream of dominating the Persian Empire would not die with him, but only gather strength with the emergence of his son, a 20-year-old named Alexander. It was Alexander who would use Philip's army, engineers, and technology to far exceed even Philip's wildest ambitions, transforming the world into a Greek one. Marriage was a key component in Philip's diplomatic strategy. Of his seven wives, only one was a Macedonian. In just 20 years, Philip II had transformed the Macedonians into a mighty army and became the absolute master of Greece. But Philip's assassination in 336 BC cut short his ultimate ambition and self-proclaimed destiny to invade Greece's age-old enemy, Persia. Philip had conquered Greece. Now it would be up to his son to conquer the world. He was a man who became known throughout history as Alexander the Great. Alexander was one of history's great commanders. He was absolutely brilliant on the battlefield. True enough, he inherits a great military machine but he has to get the credit for leading this machine at a very young age. Philip had laid the engineering groundwork for conquest. Now it was time for his son to finish the job. In 334 BC, Alexander led his Macedonian army of over 35,000 soldiers into battle against the Persian Empire. Persia was a massive superpower dominating the lands of the Middle East and Asia Minor. Alexander and his army rampaged through what is now modern-day Turkey, carving deep inroads into Persian territory. But the Persians still had an advantage that Alexander had to neutralize if he hoped to conquer Greece's age-old enemy. Alexander's got a problem. He doesn't have a fleet. So what he needs to do is to find a way to neutralize the Persian fleet. And his strategy is to fight the Persian navy on land by laying siege to and taking each of the great Persian naval bases. Alexander continued to march south along the Mediterranean coast, laying siege to the cities and ports who resisted his advance. But it was the fortified and powerful city of Tyre that would provide Alexander and his engineers with their biggest challenge. Tyre, uh, in antiquity, was an island, a small offshore island. The city actually lay on an offshore island, and that made it relatively impregnable in the eyes of the Tyrians themselves, since they had a great fleet. All of that changed in the late fourth century. At first, Alexander tried diplomacy. He sent messengers out to the island, urging city leaders to accept a peace treaty. The answer was short and to the point. They killed Alexander's ambassadors and threw their bodies from the top of the walls into the sea. The stakes were high. If Alexander failed to take the city, it would send a message to the world he wasn't invincible. With Tyre protected from his land forces by the sea, it was up to his engineers to bring the battlefield to the city, where Alexander could fight the Tyrians face to face. Tyre would be an island no more. What if the enemy refused to come out and fight you? But Alexander realized that he could not allow his military operations to get bogged down in the face of fortifications. And that meant that he needed uh, techniques and weaponry that could attack fortifications. With mammoth walls and a fortified harbor and very little land around the walls, the city of Tyre was long thought to be impregnable. Thus, Alexander resolved to a very, very ambitious approach. He knew he couldn't take the city unless he did damage to the walls. So he had his engineers build a causeway, a bridge from the mainland to the island. Causeway was about half mile long, 200 feet wide, 20 feet high. When the causeway was within striking distance, Alexander unleashed a hail of terror on the city. And then he deployed the only weapon he knew would end the battle, a siege tower. The 
towers were a kind of multi-storied armored car that moved forward on wheels. Outside, they were fireproofed with rawhide, covering the entire wooden structure. Inside, a central staircase led to a series of platforms where Oxabeles and other catapults launched missiles onto Tyre's walls. Down below, others used the tower as protection to wield a ground-level battering ram. They'd literally wheel them up to the wall. The men inside would be protected, and they would be shooting arrows at the defenders on the wall and uh, trying to cross over onto the wall and to kill the defenders. Alexander's siege towers pummeled the walls of Tyre for days. Once the fortress had been breached, Alexander went for the jugular. He unleashed a firestorm of reprisal upon the city that had resisted him. The assault itself uh, would really be a terrifying experience for everyone involved. The only way to signal would be through trumpets, so you have to imagine trumpets blaring, a tremendous noise of men uh, attacking, flags blowing in the wind uh, on the battlements uh, of the city that was under attack. I think it would have been an extraordinary scene. Alexander resumed his trek southward through Palestine, his confidence soaring he now set his sights on the greatest empire the world had ever seen, Egypt. With its soaring pyramids and unrivaled colossal tombs, Egypt was an ancient culture Alexander revered. But there was another more practical reason Alexander coveted Egypt. It was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, whose wheat fields would be invaluable in feeding Alexander's expanding empire. But unlike Tyre, conquering the Egyptians required no bloodshed. Alexander entered uh, Egypt as a liberator and as a figure of extraordinary uh, powers. The Egyptians not only welcomed Alexander, they made him a god. In 331 BC, they crowned Alexander Pharaoh, proclaiming him a son of Amman, their most important deity. At age 24, Alexander had transcended mortality. One can imagine that someone to whom extraordinary things happened, uh, to whom all doors seemed to open themselves magically, uh, to whom every endeavor was rewarded with victory, would think, well, perhaps I am, uh, in, in some respect, uh, a god. And I think that Alexander really did think this. He wasn't just pretending. Uh, he, he, was, he was trying to find out more about himself. By the late 4th century BC, Greek cities were springing up in the wake of Alexander's marauding army. These cities served as centers of control and administration, but more importantly, they became a means of spreading a unifying fabric of Greek language, culture, and learning. The result would be a template of city engineering that would extend to the farthest regions of Alexander's empire. Alexander ordered that his soldiers be clean-shaven so that enemies couldn't grab their beards in close combat. By 325 BC, Alexander had extended his borders almost 3,000 miles from Greece in the west to modern-day India in the east. Alexander's army may have been a wrecking machine, but the legacy his empire left in its wake was a new Greek world. Alexander's strategy for ruling conquered nations included both accommodation and assimilation. He often left soldiers behind to marry local women and act as officials in his growing empire. Towns that were formerly Persian, Egyptian, or Indian were transformed into Greek cities. It was an invasion of ideals that formed a hybrid culture that became known as Hellenism. So definitely there are striking parallels with what's going on today, in our today era of globalization. Today we have a common language, which is English, is the language of trade. After Alexander the Great, you have people who have adopted the Greek customs and the Greek language. 
Hellenism was built on city life, and nowhere did this expansion of Greek domination show up more so than in city planning. Whether they were beginning a new city or reshaping an old one, as the empire grew, Alexander's engineers laid it out on a grid plan that the Greeks had used since the 5th century BC. The grid plan, which was used in these cities, uh, was a symbol of order. Any government that could replace the traditional winding alleyways of a city with uh, a rectilineal grid plan of streets at right angles uh, was a government to be feared, a government uh, to take notice of. Alexander's campaigns in Asia Minor would create a new world order. Today we call it Hellenism. If you lived in a city conquered by Alexander, you lived in a Greek city. This is an example of such a city. It's called Pergamum. 2,000 years ago, Pergamum would have had all the elements of a Greek city. Agora, temples, gymnasium, theater. Pergamum would eventually rival Athens as a cultural center. As a matter of fact, the sculptural style pulled out of Pergamum would galvanize Michelangelo and change the face of the visual arts forever. Pergamum was built on a series of slopes. It was engineered like this. It was dramatic. It was theatrical. And it was meant to be. Today, the remains of Pergamum stand high above in modern-day Turkey, a spectacular monument to Greek urban engineering. The city seems to be clinging on this steep hill. It seems that the architects who built this uh, city sort of took into account the uh, topography in many ways, symbolically to start with, meaning that higher up were the palaces, and the temples. The city rises about a thousand feet above sea level, which necessitated a series of complex and extensive terraces. In Hellenistic times, Athens was no longer the power center that it was before. There was a shift toward other cities of importance. In that vacuum, Pergamum rose to power. In some ways, it's an echo of the Acropolis of Athens, where the temples stand on a hill a natural rock over the city, and no expense is spared in building splendid temples and splendid public buildings in Pergamon. And so Greek city planning begins earlier than Alexander, but it's taken to perfection in the Hellenistic period. Wherever you go, each of them has a recognizable institution. Each of them will have a Greek theater. Each of them will have Greek temples. Each of them will have a gymnasium. Each of them will have a agora, a marketplace come forum. The focal point of a Greek city could be found in its public marketplace called the agora. Here, merchants would peddle their daily wares and citizens would congregate to discuss the political issues of the day. Adjacent to the agora was the stoa, a simple structure that was the equivalent of an ancient indoor mall. The stoa consisted of a colonnade on one side with a back wall on the other, a shelter providing an open space that was still protected from the elements. The agora and the stoas were the economic, public, and political heart of the Hellenistic city, but its cultural soul lay in another engineering marvel and was arguably the most important in Hellenistic cities, the theater. The theater is basically an Athenian invention. Drama is, above all, democratic. Uh, it develops in Athens concomitantly with the Athenian democracy. Theater was an essential and very important aspect of uh, the Greek outlook to the world, how they thought of themselves and uh, how they thought of the world. And uh, I think to, to many people's opinion, is one of the great legacies that the ancient Greek civilization has bestowed upon us today. Theaters in ancient Greece were not only forums of social commentary, they inspired the Romans in their building of colosseums and set the standard of stadium design for the next 2,000 years. Separate your men by tribe, by clan, such that clan may bear aid to clan and tribe to tribe. Thus spake Nestor to Agamemnon in the Iliad. And those words might have been said here, because one of the great gifts of Greek culture to the world is theater and music. This is a Greek theater. 
at Pergamum. It is the steepest of its kind. Now, a Broadway theater, and I've played in a few, holds between eight or 900 people and maybe 2,000 if it's a musical house. This theater holds thousands and thousands and thousands of spectators. So how in the heck can an actor stand on that stage and project his voice such as that the spectator in the very last row at the back of this theater can hear what he's saying? Well, the answer is sort of an engineering feat. The theater, first of all, is dug out of the side of a mountain, and it doesn't need a very big substructure because the side of the mountain provides the support for these stone benches. Second of all, the theater is in a semicircle, and the semicircle gives way to an amazing sense of acoustics. You can stand on that stage, and you can almost whisper, and someone in the very back row would hear you as if you were speaking right into his ear because the sound would bounce off the back wall. Third thing is, is that the actors wore masks. And these masks not only function as character, but they also function as sort of a megaphone through the lips. So these three elements combined, this theater would be a fantastic place to come and hear the Agamemnon performed by Aeschylus. I think undoubtedly the best preserved ancient Greek theater, uh, the theater at Epidauros in the Argolid Peninsula in the Peloponnesus. Greek theaters were divided into three basic parts the theatron, or viewing area, in which the audience sat, the orchestra, or dancing area in which most of the action took place, and the skene, a timber building set behind the orchestra. The skene and its flat roof were used for dressing rooms, as a backdrop, and sometimes for staging scenes. The theater at Epidaurus has 55 rows of seats and is divided into three horizontal seating sections, Stairs divide the sections of seats into separate wedges. In all, this giant theater has an estimated seating capacity of 12 to 14,000 people. But it's the acoustical engineering that makes the theater at Epidaurus clearly spectacular. If you're sitting up in the top row, you're a long way away from the stage. Uh, and the person who's down in the orchestra or on the stage looks quite tiny. And yet, you can have a conversation with that person with only a slight elevation of your voice. In just 10 years, Alexander had set the stage for Greek culture to dominate the world. But empires and their leaders eventually fall. Alexander was no exception. His untimely end would give rise to kings and kingdoms whose engineering feats would be considered ancient wonders of the world. In 326 BC, Alexander founded the city of Bucephala in honor of his slain horse. By 323 BC, Alexander had forged an empire that spread from Greece in the west down through Egypt and to India in the east. His conquests hinged on his army's use of advanced technology, but they also depended on Alexander's legendary ability to command the loyalty of thousands of men. But after 13 years and thousands of miles of constant warfare, that loyalty was stretched to the breaking point. His troops, their loyalty finally was used up. They rebelled against him, they refused to go further, and he had to turn around. While returning from India, Alexander was preparing to consolidate his empire when he was struck by a mysterious illness. No one knows exactly what it was that killed him, whether it was an infection, whether it was the result of uh, a very hard life as a soldier in which he was wounded in battle, of these extraordinary travels in which he, according to legend, subjected himself to the same hardships as his soldiers. One of the stories is that, that he essentially drank himself to death. There was always intrigue at the Macedonian court. Alexander's father had been assassinated. Is it possible that he was poisoned in some way? Those are questions we can't answer. On June 10, 323 BC, just one month shy of 33 years old, the most powerful man on earth was dead. Now the stunning rise of his sudden empire would be matched by its spectacular and bloody fragmentation. A power struggle between the regional commanders quickly ensued to fill the void left by Alexander's death. 
these generals and their heirs carved out vibrant Hellenistic kingdoms and for generations fought a continual battle for dominance. The land of Egypt would fall to Alexander's general Ptolemy, who had been left to oversee the wealthy territory on the Nile. Ptolemy would shape a kingdom that combined Greek and Egyptian culture into a dynasty that would last for almost 300 years. Uh, Ptolemy I was a man who had made a career as a uh, military commander and advisor under Alexander. What he therefore wanted was as rich and secure a portion of that empire as he could get. Egypt was the crown jewel of the Mediterranean. Its surplus of grain meant that a windfall awaited Ptolemy as ruler of the breadbasket of the ancient world. Ptolemy's plan was to ensure his legitimacy both as Egypt's king and also true heir to Alexander. Macedonian tradition held that the one who buried the body of the king secured his rights to the throne. So Ptolemy hijacked the funeral procession of Alexander and brought the mummified body to Egypt, where it would eventually rest in Alexandria, the same city Alexander himself had founded 15 years earlier. Under Ptolemy, Egypt would grow to be a powerful kingdom, and Alexandria would transform itself into the intellectual and scientific capital of the Greek world. He wanted it to be a city that uh, joined with Greek culture and used both Greek and Egyptian technological know-how uh, to build a new Athens, if you will. Alexandria lies on Egypt's coastline, and an easily accessible harbor would be vital for sustaining trade with other cities around the Mediterranean. To that end, Ptolemy ordered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever seen, the world's first known lighthouse. During the night, it's shown uh, to a great distance, and ships can actually see it from many, many miles away. And during the day, there was smoke coming out of it, so it was still very visible. It must have been a formidable thing to behold. At the time, only the Great Pyramid at Giza was taller than the lighthouse. Legend says it stood 300 feet tall, comparable in size to the Statue of Liberty. Some estimates claim the lighthouse may have stood as tall as 450 feet. How the lighthouse was built remains a mystery, but 25 miles from Alexandria, a funeral monument stands that researchers believe is a scaled-down replica of the actual lighthouse. Based on that model, it appears the lighthouse was constructed with three separate and distinct levels. The lower level was square, the one above was octagonal, and the final one was cylindrical. And on top, there was the beacon. From the top of the lighthouse, a strong and steady beam of light emanated out into the sea. Scholars believe wood was most likely the lighthouse's fuel, and that the lower section housed a spiral ramp large enough for pack animals to climb, pulling carts laden with firewood. The ramps may have led to a series of storage rooms where the firewood was kept. From the second level upwards, a shaft with a dumb waiter was probably used to lift fuel up to the top. There are uh, stories about uh, mirrors and devices that could uh, amplify uh, the light of this uh, fire so that it could be seen from uh, miles and miles away. But uh, there is no real evidence of such a thing. And there are quite a few scholars who believe that it was just a normal beacon, it was just a big fire uh, and uh, nothing more. The lighthouse stood for almost 1,600 years, battered by storms, tidal waves, and even earthquakes. Then around 1300 AD, massive quakes brought that ancient wonder of the world crashing down for good. For nearly 700 years, the lighthouse lay buried underneath the waters of the Mediterranean. Then, in 1994, a team of divers and archaeologists uncovered massive stones in Alexandria's harbor, revealing what may be the foundations of a guiding light in engineering history. 
Jean-Yves Envereur, a well-known French uh, archaeologist, started a very, very important series of uh, underwater research. He is finding um, members, architectural members, of the uh, pharaohs. So there might come a day when it may even be uh, restored. Beneath the waves, archaeologists documented pieces of stone that weighed more than 70 tons including one piece that was believed to be the lentil of the lighthouse's massive doorway. But the lighthouse would not be Ptolemy's only engineering marvel in Alexandria. As the lighthouse rose above the skyline, he launched another building project, one that brought the greatest minds in the world to his cosmopolitan city. It was called the Great Library of Alexandria, a place that claimed to have over 200,000 scrolls dedicated to knowledge and learning. It was here that one engineer would harness the power of steam 1,700 years before the world ever imagined a locomotive. It was in Alexandria during the reign of Ptolemy II that the Hebrew Bible was first translated into Greek. After the death of Alexander and breakup of his empire, one of his generals who had formerly lived his life conquering civilizations now wanted to create one. Ptolemy's infusion of Greek culture into Egypt's wealth and prestige would lay the foundations for a new kind of city, one that would become the greatest and most cosmopolitan in the ancient world, Alexandria. It's the city of the world. And as such, the kings, the Ptolemaean kings of uh, the new kingdom of Egypt, created something that is completely new in the known world. It would be the towering fires of Alexandria's lighthouse that guided ships into the harbor. But it was another vision of Ptolemy's that became a beacon for the greatest minds in the world, Alexandria's museum and library. But that does not mean it was for exhibiting something. A museum at that time meant something like a research center. It's a think tank, perhaps the world's first great think tank. And Ptolemy buys great scholars and writers from uh, around the Greek world. And the library is the greatest repository of books uh, in the Greek world. It had a mythical amount of scrolls, something, some say 200,000, some say 700,000. It was at the museum and library where for the first time in human history, knowledge becomes a commodity to be stored and shared. In fact, some scientific discoveries made in Alexandria over 200 years before Christ wouldn't be accepted until 1800 years later. Pupils were taught the Earth was round, and one of the great astronomers, Eratosthenes, calculated the circumference of the Earth and was off by less than 1%. So it's perhaps a very interesting story that the Ptolemaean kings, uh, whenever a ship will come into Alexandria, uh, the first thing that uh, the captain had to do is had to declare if he had any papyri, any uh, works of philosophers or science on board. They were taken to the library to be copied, but usually they gave the captain back a copy and not the original. Although Ptolemy was a Macedonian Greek, the key to the success of his dynasty in Egypt would be in its willingness to assimilate Egyptian culture. Ptolemy's own family went to great lengths to adopt Egyptian practices as their own. Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy II, even married his own sister, Arsinoe. There had been a tradition in the Egyptian pharaonic families of brother-sister marriage because, and there was a sense that a figure like that couldn't just marry any old ordinary mortal and that eventually only a sister who sort of shared his divine origins was an appropriate companion and spouse. The Ptolemies may have used Egyptian traditions to elevate themselves to the status of gods, but in the end, like all pharaohs before them, these kings were still mortal. Ptolemy wouldn't live to see all of his dreams of Alexandria fully realized. 
He died in 283 BC of natural causes before the library and even the lighthouse were finally completed. Alexandria continued to flourish as a mecca for knowledge under its Ptolemaic rulers and produced many of the age's foremost thinkers. And it would be just after the end of their nearly 300 year reign in the first century AD that Alexandria would produce one of the most famous Greek engineers in history. His name was Hero, and his famous designs place him among the ancient world's greatest mechanical engineers. All his books are extremely detailed, very well describing all engineering procedures. But Hero himself also was good in the sense that he has an inclination in favor of arts. We must remember that in, uh, in ancient Greek, the word art was meaning also technology. Hero's engineering designs had many practical uses, including ideas for fire extinguishers, odometers, and even automatic doors. But it was Hero's experiments with steam technology that would ignite his imagination. The first working steam engine was built in England around 1700 AD. Over 1600 years earlier, Hero built the forerunner of the steam engine, called an Eola pile. It was a, a metal a sphere put up in such a way so that it could uh, rotate freely and had two tubes applied when filled with water and heated from below, steam developed and uh, started to turn to put the sphere into motion, thereby turning air into something very useful, something that you could control. We maintain that under other historical circumstances, this industrial revolution could possibly have taken place in Alexandria after a couple of centuries. The essence was there. The interesting thing about the steam engine of Hero is that the guy discovered steam power. Okay, so the question beckons, how comes they didn't use steam power? How comes they didn't make uh, steam engines like uh, the English did? a few centuries later. And uh, the answer to that is that in Egypt, forced labor or slave labor was so cheap, you didn't need machines to do the job. So that's like an interesting idea. You can have a technology and you don't know what to do with it because there's not a real economical need for it. Hero's inventions still intrigue engineers to this day, but there might have been many more innovations from Alexandria we may never know. Scholars don't agree on when it happened, but much of the ancient world's scientific knowledge vanished into smoke and ashes when the ancient library burned to the ground. Still, Alexandria and Greek engineering were flames of innovation that lit the ancient world like a star that guides a ship across the sea. The miraculous age of Alexander may have seen empires rise and fall, but what's left in its wake is a legacy still felt in our own world today. To outsmart the raw forces of nature and to turn them into something beneficial. That's the common denominator for all Greek engineering. Alexandria was no doubt the pinnacle of Greek mathematics and engineering with its fantastic library that sadly went up in flames and the tomb of a man who not only conquered the world but showered it with Hellenism. The passing of ideas and ideals, the culture and values of Greece. But even as Alexander's empire crumbled, Greece was not to be extinguished, no. It was absorbed by what many believe was the greatest experiment in Hellenism of all, Rome. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. It is a story wrapped in myth and legend. How did a tribe of wandering nomads engineer the America's greatest empire in just 200 years? They had to devise engineering systems which were extraordinary for their age. Their civilization rivaled Rome in its sophistication. The Aztecs had the best 
technology that could be produced in the conditions of which they live. Aqueducts, palaces, pyramids, and temples stood as a tribute to their gods and a testament to the power of humankind. The Aztecs' crowning achievement was a gleaming capital city that astonished European explorers called the Venice of the New World. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. Their thirst for power and blood set them on a course for destruction. When it finally came, their annihilation would be swifter and more complete than the world had ever known. In 1825 AD, central Mexico, near modern-day Mexico City. A young girl, just a teenager, is celebrating her impending wedding. She is the daughter of a tribal king, and she is about to join a new tribe that has been a guest of her kingdom. That tribe is now known as the Aztecs. As part of the ritual, five Aztec noblemen lead her to an ancient temple for the ceremony. But as she reaches the top, the noblemen suddenly veer her away from the altar and onto a slab of stone in front of the temple, one used for sacrifice. Each man holds a limb, while a fifth lifts an obsidian knife high in the air. With one searing move, he slashes it through her chest and extracts her still beating heart. That evening, the king is invited to a ceremony to celebrate the marriage. Instead, he finds a priest performing a dance, wearing the still glistening skin of his daughter. As part of the ritual, the Aztecs had flayed her to honor the god of fertility. He saw this, and it was absolutely horrified at what he saw, his dear daughter. And so he and his forces immediately chased the, the Aztecs into the lake and onto this island where they sought refuge. The marshy island was an unwelcoming place. Yet it was from here that the Aztecs would beat the odds against them and forge the most powerful empire of the Americas. Hi, I'm Peter Weller. When I think of the Aztecs, I think of an elegant people with beautiful skin and flamboyant headdresses of many colors, and I think of floating cities and a terrific song by Neil Young about Moctezuma and Cortez. But I also think of knives, of obsidian glass ripping into chest cavities and hands, pulling out bleeding hearts and holding them high. Most of the Aztec sacrifices were performed in a temple atop a stone pyramid like this one. The Aztecs felt that without these offerings, the sun would literally cease to rise and the universe would die. Now, Aztec history is a fusion of fact and myth. But what we do know is that this murder, as horrific as it was, not only marked the beginning of the Aztec Empire, it also marked the location from where it would rise. The island the Aztecs were banished to after their disastrous sacrifice of the princess was in Lake Texcoco, the largest of five interconnected lakes covering a valley about 40 by 70 miles. Today, this once vast and open valley is teeming with what is modern-day Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. But 700 years ago, the island was so swampy, no one had laid claim to it. Now, as they gazed on the lake, the Aztec leader Tenoch announced to his followers that he had seen an eagle perched on a cactus in the middle of the lake, a sign from the gods that they had found their new home. They would name their city Tenochtitlan. 
Life is tough for the Aztecs in the early days of Tenochtitlan, but they have a vision. A vision of a powerful city modeled on an ancient and legendary city just 25 miles away. They called this city Teotihuacan, or City of the Gods. We know very little about Teotihuacan because all we have is the archaeological remains. We don't have any writing. We don't have any documentation that, that really fleshes out what went on at this big city. It was in ruins, even in Aztec times. But they believed it to be the stomping grounds of the gods and the literal birthplace of the sun itself. The place the Aztecs most revered in Teotihuacan was a pyramid that rose above the tree line. It was called the Pyramid of the Sun. The massive Sun Pyramid contains a million cubic yards of earth and stone, with a base roughly the same as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Aztecs believe Teotihuacan was laid out in the image of the cosmos created by their gods. Now it was this image they would attempt to replicate in the construction of their new city, Tenochtitlan. Taking on the challenge would be an Aztec leader named Acamapichtli. In 1376, he embarked on an ambitious plan to engineer an advanced city at Tenochtitlan. But there was a problem. The swampy islands that they took over needed a lot of work. When they started to build anything, it would begin to subside. There was simply no foundation on which to build. The Aztec solution would revolutionize the architecture of the Americas. They began by anchoring their buildings deep in the ground using a system of pilings made from wood. Workers cut stakes into 30-foot lengths, three to four inches wide. These were driven into the soft ground to make a foundation. The pilings were often surrounded with volcanic stone to add strength. Masons and bricklayers could then build walls on top of this base with confidence. They have found wooden pylons to hold the foundations of the, of the pyramids. The fact that it didn't sink or the fact that it didn't just topple, I think that's a major feat of engineering. Tenochtitlan was an island city, but the lakes surrounding it were very shallow, sometimes only seven feet deep. The whole thing looked like a giant metroplex floating on a pond. Originally, the only way to get from this floating city to the mainland was by boat. But the Aztecs eventually devised a series of causeways, sometimes 45 feet wide, that would connect their floating city to the mainland provinces. The causeway was supported by strong wooden pilings, the same pilings that supported their temples and other buildings. Thousands of these pilings had to be driven deep into the lake bed, and this presented a logistical challenge that could only be met by a strong, skilled labor force and the best of Mesoamerica's engineers. To build a causeway, two lines of stakes were laid out. Then the space between them was filled with stones and earth until it reached several feet above the water level. This allowed the road to support enormous weight. These causeways were built very straight. Uh, they were very wide with bridges that would open up uh, that connected the city to the north, to the west, and to the south. The roads enabled the Aztecs to transport larger, heavier materials for building. But this presented a new challenge. There were no beasts of burden in Mesoamerica, so everything had to be done with humans. No carts, no wheel. Small loads would be carried on the back with a rope hung from the forehead. Large items like stone blocks or sculptures for a temple would be dragged by huge numbers of men pulling ropes, possibly using logs as rollers. Legend has it one stone bound for a temple required a force of 50,000 men to drag it from the mountains on the mainland across the causeway and into the city. The causeways would also present the Aztecs with a new way to get fresh water to Tenochtitlan. In the past, the Aztecs had transported water in canoes from the shore. But a huge boom in the city's population meant they needed a higher tech solution to keep up with demand. 
they wanted to use water from the springs on the mainland, and so they wanted to build an aqueduct. But the springs were under control of the dominant tribe in the region, the ruthless Tepaniks. The Tepaniks were the controllers or the dominators of all the valley. They had a, a, a very strong empire. So they were the lords of the valley. So the Aztecs were tributary subjects to them. As the Aztec population grew, tensions with the Tepaniks began to simmer. Now the Aztecs decided to issue an ultimatum that could change the balance of power in the region. The people of Tenochtitlan not only demanded that the Tepaniks give them the water, but also demanded that they help construct the aqueduct. The Tepaniks' answer was swift and brutal. The Tepanek king, Maxtala, sent assassins who murdered the reigning Aztec leader in cold blood. This was the final straw. After decades of domination, the Aztecs would finally make their move and wage war against their ruthless overlords. And they would launch a series of wildly ambitious building projects around their growing island city that would earn them a reputation as the greatest engineers of the Americas. It is 1428, and the Aztecs have declared war on their overlords, a tribe called the Tepaniks. But to defeat the Tepaniks, they would need a little help from their neighbors. The Aztecs approached the nearby city-state of Texcoco. There, a decisive leader was on the rise. His name was Coyotl, and his domineering leadership would be instrumental in forging the Aztec Empire. With Coyotl at their side, the Aztec underdogs would go for the jugular. They launched an all-out attack on the Tepanek capital. After a siege of more than 100 days, they broke through Tepanek defenses and slaughtered their oppressors. After capturing the Tepanek king, Maxtla, King Netzwalcoyotl personally cut out his heart and sprinkled his blood into the waters of Lake Texcoco. Suddenly, the tables had turned. That is the exact moment of the beginning of the empire, and the Aztecs became the leaders of the Valley of Mexico. After conquering the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs could now turn their attention to bringing clean water to their growing city. Remarkably, the Aztecs would independently design and build something that only a few world empires would master, the aqueduct. The aqueduct actually had two channels, each about five feet high and three feet wide. One would be cleaned and maintained, while the other was being used so the water flow was never interrupted. The twin tube aqueduct ran for three miles from the mainland to the center of the island city. In town, water streamed into public fountains and reservoirs and was distributed to the public in large clay jars or by canoe. In comparison to the Europeans, the Aztec were a very clean people. Uh, we know that the uh, Aztec emperor bathed twice a day. So in terms of hygiene, the Aztec people uh, was much more advanced than the Europeans. While the Aztec nobles were bathing in luxury, at this time in Europe, plague caused by unsanitary conditions was killing millions. King Netzwalcoyotl's own bath was one of the most unique in the Americas. It was fed by a sophisticated aqueduct system that also brought running water to his palace grounds. Behind me is the hill of Tezcozinco. And on this hill, Nezahualcoyotl built a fantastic pleasure palace. And around this palace, a virtual botanical garden filled with all of the exotic flowers of Mesoamerica. Nezahualcoyotl brought water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to here, into this hill, to his palace, just to water his plants. To install an aqueduct there, Nezahualcoyotl had to fill a huge gorge between Tezcozinco and the next hill. As the water arrived at the first hill, 
it gathered in small pools built to control the speed of the flow before it reached the aqueduct. After crossing the aqueduct, the water ran in a circuit around Tetsuko Cinco Hill, spilling off over the sides in rock-cut waterfalls to water the gardens. It ended up in a nearly perfectly round rock-cut pool called the King's Bath. And from here, he could look upon his domain at Texcoco, and he could look down at the botanical gardens that he was watering with his fantastic aqueducts. It is indeed a bath fit for a king. By the mid-15th century, with their empire on the rise, it was time for the Aztecs to choose a sovereign leader. He was called Moctezuma, and he would be the first of two emperors with this now famous name. Moctezuma's first order of business was to extend the empire's borders. The Aztecs captured city-states southward to the Valley of Oaxaca, westward to the Pacific, and east toward the Gulf of Mexico. By 1449, the empire contained as many as 15 million people. In the short span of 100 years, the Aztecs accomplished the impossible. They had toppled the Mesoamerican world order. But while the Aztecs dominated militarily, their island city was vulnerable to a different kind of enemy. Like New Orleans, Tenochtitlan was constantly doing battle with water. And one of Moctezuma's first projects was to protect his city from the deluge of water surrounding it. This is what is left of Lake Xochimilco, in the southern part of Mexico City, in Aztec times, the city of Tenochtitlan. This lake, like the other four lakes that surrounded the city, were spring-fed. Thus, there were no rivers or streams into which it could drain. And if it rained hard enough, the water would rise up and sweep over the land and into the city itself. And this is exactly what happened in the mid-1400s when a flood of catastrophic proportions swept into Tenochtitlan. The city and the empire it commanded were almost completely destroyed, and the Aztec civilization had to once again rely upon the genius of its engineers, and one engineer in particular. Moctezuma enlisted the help of his old ally, Nezualcoyotl, to protect the city he was rebuilding from the lake. Nezualcoyotl would design a solution that would make him the greatest engineer on the continent. His plan was to create a safe zone around the city with a huge dike that would protect Tenochtitlan and its inhabitants. It was designed to be larger than any earthwork anywhere in the Americas at the time, running for 10 miles just east of the city from the southern edge of the lake across to the north. The walls were a wickerwork construction made of sticks, reeds, stone, and earth. Since the lake was shallow, the dike was only about 12 feet in height, but some 27 feet wide. Netzwalcoyotl fitted the dike with sluice gates, most likely wooden doors that would be raised or lowered to control the water level behind it. The dike also served another purpose. It protected their water supply. It was important to build some sort of protective mechanism to keep salt water out of the freshwater western part of the lake. An army marches on its stomach, so said Napoleon. Now an ample food supply for civilians is a no-brainer in the critical development of any civilization. But the Aztecs perfected a unique method, not only to provide a substantial food supply for its civilian populace, but to fuel the military expansion of its empire. This revolutionary engineering was called chinampas, a system that allowed them to literally create new land to farm and to live on. If you're going to have a city of any size, you have to provide room for them. And so what they did was build up these chinampas in the lake bed. Basically, a chinampa is an artificial island built in the lake. They look like narrow football fields, about 300 feet long by about 30 feet wide. A chinampa was built by weaving a web of sticks floating in the water and piling reeds on top of them. 
mud was then scraped from the lake bottom and piled atop the reeds to form the chinampa. It took four to six men eight days to build the average chinampa. They were connected to the city by massive navigational canals that would take thousands of men months to build. A chinampa like this one could produce up to seven crops a year, whereas a farm on the mainland could yield one, maybe two, maybe three at the most. As a crop was ready to harvest on a chinampa, seedlings from another would be sprouting out of mud that would be spread on a boat adjacent to the chinampa. Then when the seedlings were ready, they'd be transported to the chinampa, and this cycle would be repeated over and over and over again on hundreds and then thousands of chinampas. Now, it was this technology that transformed Tenochtitlan from just another tribal town in the 14th century to a dominant and thriving city-state. With their city's infrastructure in place and vast lands under their control, the Aztecs would push the boundaries of their empire further than ever before. They'd create a far-flung network of roads, Aztec superhighways. But as the empire grew, so too did their practice of human sacrifice. Soon, rivers of blood would be flowing through the streets of Tenochtitlan. Today, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, is gone, buried under modern-day Mexico City. But 700 years ago, it was a shining capital on the rise, built by advanced engineers and led by larger-than-life emperors. By the late 15th century, the Aztec population had exploded. Their next great emperor would launch a series of conquests that would rival anything in world history. His name was Ahuitzotl, and he would prove to be an even greater warrior than his grandfather, Moctezuma. By 1502, Ahuitzotl had conquered territory from Mexico's Pacific coast and pushed the empire as far south as Guatemala. His reign was kind of like a golden age. He was a king that opened up transport routes to the coastal areas and to lowland areas where the Aztecs got their greatest luxuries, these shimmering tropical feathers, the gold, the precious stones that the, the nobles and rulers wore as symbols of their station in life. To transport riches to the heart of the empire, the Aztecs constructed a network of superhighways throughout central Mexico. Relay runners were stationed every few miles to create a sort of ancient Federal Express. Messages or goods could be sent 200 miles from the Gulf Coast to Tenochtitlan in just 24 hours, faster than the Postal Service today. With the empire at its height, the Aztecs under Ahuitzotl embarked on their greatest construction project, a massive pyramid at the very center of Tenochtitlan, the symbol of their absolute power. It was called the Templo Mayor, or Great Temple. The base of the pyramid was 240 feet deep by 300 feet wide and rose to a height of 15 stories. There were at least 117 steps in two staircases climbing 200 feet leading to twin temples to honor the gods of rain and war. The temple was rebuilt on the same location seven times, beginning in 1325 with the city's founding. As the empire grew, so did the pyramid. Each stage was simply built right on top of the stage before. The Temple Mayor was built mainly uh, with a stone called Tezontli, that is uh, volcanic stone. It's a very light weight stone. That would uh, prevent the sinking of the, of the temple. For floors and walls, the Aztecs applied a lime plaster, which was a form of concrete. Some examples found today remain as hard as modern concrete, even after 500 years. Aztec workers labored for decades to complete their monument to the gods. The temple remained buried until 1978, when power company workers digging a trench accidentally uncovered a huge carved stone 
and discovered the temple ruins next to it. The disk, 11 feet in diameter, weighs eight tons and depicts the dismembered body of the goddess Koyoshalkwi. Koyoshalkwi was the moon goddess, but her brother murdered her because she became pregnant in a very shameful way. Now, the Aztecs weren't prudes by any means. Matter of fact, nobles had many wives and concubines, but amongst the commoners, particularly women, adultery was a no-no and severely punished, often by death. So according to legend, the moon goddess's brother cut her head off, and after he decapitated her, he shoved her body down a hill. The Aztecs reenacted this killing literally and frequently in festivals throughout their calendar year. They would decapitate their victims at the top of a pyramid like this and then push the carcasses down the steps to the great stone at the bottom. For the Romans, their most precious treasure was gold. For the Egyptians, it was the afterlife. For the Aztecs, it was human blood. They felt a sense of reciprocity with the gods, so they needed to give a thanksgiving to the gods, giving the most precious thing they had that was human blood. The Aztecs called it precious water, and they believed that if the gods didn't receive it in massive quantities, the world would end in apocalypse. It was common practice to adorn the walls of the insides of the temples with fresh human blood. And the smell must have been appalling. To dedicate his expansion of the great temple, Emperor Awitzotl held a mass sacrifice. The heads of victims were displayed prominently on skull racks around the temple. According to some uh, chronicles, they say that there were sacrificed 20,000 people. From a practical point of view and from a scientific point of view, it sounds impossible. So I think that the chronicle that is written by Spanish sources is basically telling us that to their eyes, they were many. As Arweed Zotel's reign continued, the bloodletting skyrocketed. Life in Tenochtitlan soon became an orgy of death. Friends and enemies alike would be brought in to witness the, the sacrifices. It's always ritual, sacrifice is always a ritual event, but it was also a political statement. And it was a, kind, a form of intimidation. By the time of Awitzotl's death, the Aztecs had institutionalized sacrificial killing and turned killing on the battlefield into an art form. They were the America's fiercest fighters, an elite cadre of whom would have a spectacular new mountainside temple dedicated to them. But even they were not prepared for the war of the worlds that was about to descend upon them. Fifteen o two, Awitzotl, Emperor of the Aztecs, is dead. Moctezuma the second a 34-year-old former priest comes to power. A world away in Spain, an 18-year-old notary named Hernán Cortés is preparing to cross the Atlantic to join in his country's conquest of the New World. This is the zenith of the Aztec Empire. It now covers at least 80,000 square miles, reaching out from Tenochtitlan to both coasts and as far south as Guatemala. Some 25 million people are subject to Aztec rule. 38 provinces containing innumerable city-states are paying them heavy tribute, making the emperor and nobles fabulously rich. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions and Moctezuma II presided over it all. He was known for his statesmanship and military skills. A tough leader, he slaughtered the population of towns that wouldn't bend to his rule. But privately, he was troubled. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. 
Legend says that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. As the weeks went by, he became increasingly paranoid. But at the height of his obsession with the supernatural, a very real threat approached from across the sea. Spies posted along the Gulf Coast reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians referred to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortez landed with 11 of these floating mountains and 500 men on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The tribes were astonished by these men with metal armor and animals they had never seen. As he moved inland, tribes who resisted were brutally slaughtered, but many others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortez and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeepers sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular caught the eye of Cortez himself. She was the daughter of a chieftain who had been sold into slavery and was called La Malinche. They developed an intimate relationship, and in time, she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the New World. But she was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortez, and her role expanded to advisor and intermediary between him and the Aztecs. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his city. As he advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, Cortez amassed an army of thousands. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights, dressed as jaguars and eagles. The Aztec knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the cave temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now, over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now, the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now, the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortez and Moctezuma would be peaceful, but the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new would soon take place. And the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most frightening events in the history of the Americas. It 
It is the fall of 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés has finally reached the gleaming Aztec capital he has heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanies him as he advances on the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortes offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortes away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity. Nobody touches Montezuma, the great lord of the land. The meeting of the two worlds was peaceful, but fraught with tension. Moctezuma by this time had become increasingly impulsive and prone to bouts of hysteria. So the encounter was a, an, an encounter of, of sensing the, the, the forces no, in each side. But the Aztecs had a diplomacy and a warfare system that was somewhat naive in comparison to the very tricky and sly system of the Europeans. Moctezuma invited the Spaniards to stay in one of his palaces. It would prove to be a catastrophic mistake. As the Spaniards entered the city, they were so awed they thought they were dreaming. At the heart of the city stood the emperor's colossal palace. The palace of Moctezuma II was a massive complex spread across six acres near the great temple. One of the Spaniards noted that every day at Moctezuma's palace, 600 nobles gathered, and they would hear the word of their emperor. Moctezuma received the Spaniards in a large reception chamber just beyond the main entrance, designed to make the emperor appear omnipotent. But Moctezuma's palace would be the last ever built by the Aztecs. Not a week into their visit, the Spaniards went for the jugular, kidnapping Moctezuma. It was an audacious move, but it paid off. The empire appeared to be theirs. Even though Moctezuma was still the official leader of the city, it was, he was really, for some time, nothing more than a mouthpiece for Cortes. For six months, tensions within the walls of Tenochtitlan slowly simmered. Then, in the spring of 1520, it all came to a head. One morning, Spanish soldiers interrupted a sacred sacrifice and slaughtered those taking part. The move sparked an uprising. For the Aztecs, the Spaniards had committed an unspeakable sacrilege. The city became engulfed in chaos as the Aztecs marched on Moctezuma's palace. Moctezuma gets up on the top of the palace and tries to talk to the people and calm them down, and by now they're just not having any of it. Moctezuma had become nothing more than the Spaniard's puppet, a betrayal so great in the eyes of his people, they pummeled him with rocks and arrows. Shortly after, Moctezuma's lifeless body was tossed from the palace walls. Whether he died at Spanish hands or from injuries inflicted by his own people may never be known. And the Spaniards at that point decide this would be a, probably a good time to leave the city. On the night of June 30th, 1520, the Spaniards attempted to escape under cover of darkness. But they can't separate themselves from the plunder that they've gotten so far, so they're weighted down with all of the things that they want to take with them. They were easy targets for the Aztec warriors who caught them on the causeway. Bodies quickly piled up in the water. 400 Spaniards were killed along with several thousand of their Indian allies. That escape has, has come to be called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Cortez and a few others managed to escape with their lives. 
the Spaniards would now destroy the shining city of Tenochtitlan for good. He would begin by severing the lifeblood of the city, the aqueduct. As hundreds of thousands of people within the city's walls were without water, Cortes created a blockade around Tenochtitlan to cut off all outside supplies of food. So the idea of this uh, blockade was to try to, sur to make surrender the city by hunger. And the Aztecs had a tremendous resistance, so they couldn't be defeated easily. And what they decided to do is to mount a, an attack both by land and by sea. For centuries, the lake around Tenochtitlan was a barrier against invaders. But Cortes would find a way around that. He had thousands of his Indian allies carry ships in pieces up thousands of feet over the mountains to be assembled and launched into the lake. May 1521. Cortes unleashes his massive army in a final decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. 600 Spaniards, including 100 cavalrymen and upwards of 50,000 of their Indian allies, clash with the Aztec defenders of the city on its grand causeways. Brutal fighting continued for months. Day by day, Cortes raised the city block by block. He and his Indian allies were merciless in their systematic slaughter of the population. It was an extremely hard fought battle, especially in the city precincts. The Aztecs made a last stand at the great temple in Tlatelolco. Warriors lined the steep steps to rain down arrows and rocks on their enemy. But it was hopeless. On August 13th, the final Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, was captured and surrendered to Cortes. And that was just the beginning. 20 million would die of disease brought by the Spaniards. By the end of the 16th century, we estimate that the native population had been reduced by about 90%. Modern day Mexico City has been built atop the rubble of the once majestic city of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards leveled it during the construction of their own colonial capital. Even using stones from the great temple to build their cathedral still standing next to the temple ruins. The Aztec Empire had vanished, and with it, a legacy of astonishing engineering achievements. It has become clear from their sophisticated systems of urban planning, agriculture, and waterworks that the Aztecs stood among the most advanced of the world's great empires. The cave temple here at Malinalco is one of the few truly impressive Aztec achievements that the Spanish did not destroy. And stunning sights such as this begged the tantalizing question, if the Spanish had not come, what would Mexico look like today? I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel. Carthage, a land of opportunity founded more than 2,000 years ago. Driven by wealth, power, and ambition, these pioneers built an empire that dominated the Mediterranean world for over 600 years. By developing some of the ancient world's most groundbreaking technology, both at home and in the far reaches of the known world. The centerpiece, a massive harbor that held hundreds of warships, the vanguard of antiquity's most formidable navy. These ships are coming up fast. People see them coming. Carthage is here. But storm clouds were gathering on the horizon. Carthage finally had an enemy that could match it blow for blow. A superpower like the world had never seen, Rome. The Romans saw Carthage as a spear pointed at the very heart of Rome. In this to-the-death struggle, only one could emerge victorious. The other would be reduced to rubble.
bloodshed, massacre, brilliant feats of engineering, and acts of suicidal bravery will mark the collision between the ancient world's two greatest superpowers, Rome and Carthage. It will be a fight to the death, and the outcome will change the course of Western history. Welcome to Tunisia. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. When I was a kid, I heard the name Carthage, and I knew it was an ancient city. I didn't know exactly where it was. I'd heard of Hannibal and the elephants crossing the Alps and these famous wars with Rome. And I learned these wars were called Punic Wars after the Latin word Punici, which is what Rome called Carthage. But I had no idea where Carthage was. Well, it was here in the northern tip of Tunisia, and behind me is the modern capital of Tunis, a city of about two million people sitting on the Mediterranean Sea. By the fourth century BC, Carthage was an absolute empire dominating the Mediterranean with a formidable navy. But the original legend of Carthage starts in the eastern Mediterranean city of Tyre, the Phoenician city of Tyre and a beautiful woman named Dido, and the jealousy and greed and lust for power that would absolutely rip a royal family apart. Dido was the beautiful daughter of King Matan. Her husband was an ambitious Phoenician who had met an untimely end. He was murdered by her brother, Pygmalion. Terrified for her life, Dido fled across the Mediterranean from her homeland of Tyre to a no man's land at the northern tip of Africa. There she bargained with the native people to buy as much land as could be covered with the hide of an ox. Clever and cunning, Dido cut the hide into the thinnest of strips, then arranged them to enclose a large section of fertile land. There, under her governing hand, the fantastic Karthadash, or new city, would be engineered. When they came to Carthage, sized up the bay, looked at the mountains, looked at the flow of the rivers, looked at a place, the Bursa, which would be a great defensible fortress site, they said, this is it. This is where we will build our city. Dido's settlement, Carthage, quickly prospered. According to legend, tales of its wealth and Dido's beauty spread all the way to Erebus, king of the Moors. Part of Dido's story is this tale of the king of the Libyan natives, Yarbas, who wishes to marry her, but she refuses to do so. According to the storytellers, it's out of love for her assassinated husband, and she climbs onto a self-built funeral pyre and burns herself up. It was here, from her ashes, that one of the greatest empires in the known world would rise. Surrounded by bigger powers and with little land, the Phoenicians of Carthage turned to the sea. They were pioneers, pragmatic, open to new ideas, and endlessly innovative. When Dido established the city, the new city, a lot of people's eyes obviously opened wide and said, hey, a new city, a new start. And as these trading routes that Carthage pioneered expanded, it very rapidly became as international a city as any anywhere then in the world. Over the next 200 years, Carthage evolves into a major Mediterranean power, establishing colonies in Corsica, Ibiza, and North Africa. By around 700, maybe 650 BC, Carthage is a force to be reckoned with. Everybody's heard of it. Nobody messes with it. It's a very important city. Through expansive trade networks, by the 7th century BC, Carthage's new territories were generating a massive treasure chest, and its population reached 300,000, making it one of the biggest cities in the world. To some extent, you could compare it to a Manhattan. This is a huge population living in a relatively small area. So this is an important commercial and cultural hub, not only for North Africa, but also for the entire Western Mediterranean world. Before the Carthaginians' grand engineering feats had been launched in the name of the gods, Carthage's focus was closer to home. Like America 2,500 years later, 
the wealth of Carthage drew legions of people looking to make their fortune. Soon the city's architects and engineers had to find a way to house them all, a challenge that would lead to the most remarkable urban building boom in antiquity. There was something very important to the Carthaginian spirit, to its psyche, about staying within the walls of Carthage. So the pressure to design buildings that would accommodate people who wanted to live within the city was very strong. The Carthaginians would be the first on a massive level to turn the city's sky into private property by building apartments. These were as high as six stories, very densely populated. Why? Because people wanted to come to Carthage. It was a successful, happening place. If you wanted to get on in life, you wanted to come to Carthage. To build a city for the ages, first they would need materials with which to build it. The answer was located at El Hawaria on Tunis Bay. There in these remote quarries was a seemingly endless supply of limestone that was both easy to work with and quick to put up. Limestone is the perfect choice for building and there were limestone depositions geologically in that area, in that basin, very close at hand. Archaeologists speculate that like the Egyptians before them, the Carthaginians cut each block of stone using the simplest of means, water and wood. After they've chiseled a dotted line channel along the face of a rock, they take a wooden wedge, stick it in there, if it's deep enough, and then wet the wood. And what will happen naturally is the wood will expand with the water, and then it'll naturally crack the stone. The increased pressure from the expanding wood caused the stone to crack in almost perfect lines. From there, workers separated each block using crowbars and other tools. Once the massive blocks of stone were quarried and transported to the city, the Carthaginians used pier and panel style construction to quickly transform Carthage into a dynamic capital. It's very clear that by using stone in the first place, they weren't ready to pick up and go elsewhere. They were looking down the long term. For each metropolis to survive, it needs a constant source of running water. Carthage was no different, so the ancient city engineers turned to cisterns like this. Each cistern was made of a double layer of eggshell, ash, and clay, made the cistern absolutely watertight. Every home enjoyed access to a cistern through a series of pipes and channels. Carthaginians had fully equipped bathrooms with tubs and sinks and even showers years before ancient Rome. We have clear evidence way before the foundation of Carthage of domestic plumbing. But it is Carthage by 600 BC or thereabouts, and certainly Carthaginian town of Kirkwain by 450 BC, that we have the first evidence of a unified system of water usage and, critically, sewage. Any fool can put in a bathroom, but the question is what you do with the waste water and at Kirkawain, you see very clearly a unified single system that has piped water to the rooms that need it, the kitchen and the bathroom, but then piping the wastewater out to a common sewage system. This was evolutionary, yes, but it is also typically Carthaginian because it's also revolutionary. By the 6th century BC, Carthage was growing into a true city-state brimming with magnificent temples, glittering palaces, and high-rise houses. But as Carthage's flame burned brighter, the flame of their Phoenician cousins was burning out. The great Phoenician city of Tyre fell to the Babylonians in 574 BC. Carthage was now on its own. Before long, the Carthaginians would sail beyond the dusty shores of North Africa, continuing to expand their empire by conquering the seas. The Carthaginians saved money by covering their stone houses with smooth stucco, making them appear to be constructed of expensive marble. 520 BC, 3,000 oars propel 60 ships through the Pillars of Hercules, 
known today as the Straits of Gibraltar. Hanno the Navigator, the great admiral of Carthage, is sailing to the edges of the known world. He is preparing to launch a power play that could lead to total domination of the Mediterranean. So every great explorer, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, who sailed off into the unknown, seems to me a very strong parallel for the original and best of them, Hanno the Navigator. Hanno set sail to extend the boundaries of the Carthaginian network of colonies and exchange, not mere trading activities, but planting whole cities of new settlers to maintain control of land and access to its resources. Carthage's technical prowess on the seas has brought it power and wealth. By the sixth century BC, the islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands are now under its control. The hub of its power flows from a marvel of engineering, the harbor of Carthage. This is the absolute pinnacle of Carthaginian engineering. Although records are shaky, archaeologists believe it may have been constructed as early as the days of Hanno. But at the height of her power, in the second century BC, the harbor of Carthage was transformed technologically superior to any maritime facility in the world and the very lifeblood of Carthage. It was part of Carthage. It was the heart of Carthage. It was the lungs of Carthage. It was everything to Carthage, both naval and commercial. The harbor had a common entrance from the sea that was 70 feet wide, which could be closed with iron chains. Inside its gates were two separate marinas, the first for the traders and merchant vessels. The mercantile harbor, the commercial harbor, was organized with conventional wharves to make uh, as easy as possible the loading and unloading of goods. So in Carthage, readily one can imagine in say 400 BC, you would see all the goods there were in the then known world being bought, being brought, being sold in Carthage. The second, a circular harbor, was designed for military use. A series of 30 docks were arranged symmetrically. Another 140 additional berths radiated out on the perimeter of the circular port, allowing the entire harbor to hold 220 boats. Today, a lone dry dock has been excavated, a reminder of the strength the harbor once commanded. This is all that's left of the Cothon, or military harbor of ancient Carthage. A Cothon was an interior port carved out of the land as opposed to an exterior port attached to the seaside. Now, with all these beautiful villas around here, it's kind of hard to imagine that this harbor was the launch point for the wealth and power of ancient Carthage. Now, the nerve center for this maritime hub was that circular island out there where there were 40 or 50 slots for boat dry dock. And on top of that island was a big tower where trumpeters would blare signals and heralds would deliver orders and admirals would oversee operations like observing what ships were coming in from sea, be they friend or foe, while at the same time, no ships couldn't very well observe what was going on in this port. Nobody has anything approaching this potency, this power, let alone this navigational and seafaring skill so when the barriers are taken off the channel and shoof, within, you know, they're scrambled uh, as they did in World War II with airplanes. These ships are coming out fast down this channel and shoof, out into the Mediterranean. People see them coming. Carthage is here. For two centuries, Carthage dominated the Mediterranean. But a rival across the sea to the north was steadily evolving into a military machine of unparalleled potency. Rome. These two superpowers would soon find themselves in conflict over the jewel of the Mediterranean, Sicily. Carthage was built to trade, and Sicily was critical to that trading. Why? because it's right bang slap in the middle of the most important shipping lane in the world. Whoever controls Sicily controls these vital trade routes. 
The Romans saw the enormous riches that Carthage could command, and it started to just elbow into them. And the Carthaginians nudge back and say, hang on, we were there first. Please, as it were, get your tanks off my lawn. Both Rome and Carthage now had settlements on Sicily. This tension would trigger a series of wars that would rock the ancient world. The Romans saw Carthage as a spear pointed at the very heart of Rome and at their own burgeoning trade empire. So, of course, they felt they had to eliminate it. They would come to be known as the Punic Wars, named after the Roman word for the Phoenicians. The outcome would change the course of world history, and Carthage would be led by one of the greatest military geniuses of all time. Some historians believe the sailors of Carthage were the first to sail to the Americas, nearly 1,500 years before Christopher Columbus. At the beginning of the third century BC, the Republic of Rome is called down into southern Italy by a Greek town to help that town against pirates. Now, it's not long after that the two Sicilian cities get at it. One of them, Messina, originally asked Carthage for help, but then they go, nah, Let's ask Rome, because they're closer, probably a better deal. Syracuse fights Messina and Rome one battle, quits, gives up, turns himself over to Rome, and Rome, in the span of decades, has all of southern Italy and eastern Sicily. This really POs Carthage, and thus begins the First Punic War. And the outcome of this war will not only decide who owns Sicily, but who's going to be ruler of the entire southern Mediterranean Sea. 264 BC, Rome and Carthage begin the First Punic War. 17 years later, the two sides are still deadlocked in a bloody slugfest. The stalemate appears to be broken only when a fierce and charismatic military commander named Hamilcar Barca takes control of the Carthaginian forces. Hamilcar was the first great general of the Carthaginian Empire. He's the man with charisma. He's the man who knows how to get the job done, how to save their uh, coals from the fire. Between 247 and 242 BC, this fiery military tactician, Hamilcar Barca, sweeps into Sicily. He's dynamic, he's powerful, and he's absolutely ruthless. But what gives Hamilcar his real confidence is that at his back, he has a new sleek form of warship called the Quincurim. Quin meaning five, five banks of rowers. The Quincurim isn't really developed by the Carthaginians, it's developed by the Greeks. But what the Carthaginians do is make this sea-going battering ram huge. In that period of the Punic Wars, wow, they were the feat of shipbuilding and engineering. Quincream apparently had five banks of oars. Now, there's been some debate exactly how that worked, but it is believed that there were three levels uh, with five guys, two on the top two levels, each with an oar, and then one guy at the bottom. Whatever the case, it was a bigger, larger version of the trireme. However, even though it's a bigger version, the tactics involved in naval warfare are exactly the same. The main purpose of these ships is to ram the enemy ship. That's what they were engineered for. Outfitted with a bronze-covered ram, they were designed for speed and maneuverability. These were very, very, very quick. Trying to catch a Carthaginian warship was trying to, like, try to hit Muhammad Ali in his prime as a boxer. A standard quinquireme was roughly 120 feet long, 9 to 16 feet wide, and could hold up to 420 sailors. Fully manned and loaded, a quinquireme weighed more than 100 tons. On open water, these mega ships were killing machines. This thing is just coming straight at you at a speed you've never dreamt of as possible. And bang, the whole of your boat shakes, your ship shakes and you start to sink. Compare that with the trireme, where often the model was probably much more to engage with the enemy ship and have land fight at sea. The Carthaginians didn't mess about like that. They wanted to get in, they hit you once, and you drown, and they're gone to hit the next one. Deadly. 
Now, the genius of the Carthaginians was in figuring out how to mass produce these ships. They took sort of prefabricated parts and put them all together on an assembly line. So to an enemy, no sooner would a quincurine be sunk than another one would appear on the horizon. And this was a distinct disadvantage for the Roman Navy until they came upon a wrecked quincurine. And they sort of reverse engineered it. They deconstructed it, figured out how it was put together, put it back together, and made it their own. They captured a grounded Carthaginian quinquireme and made dozens of copies of these. In fact, the copies weren't as well made and were made out of green wood. And after one season, they fell to pieces. But never mind, that's all the time the Romans needed to turn the tide. The Roman and Carthaginian fleets would now square off with the ancient world's equivalent of weapons of mass destruction to see who truly owned the seas. March 10th, 241 BC, the fleets met at the Agates Islands off the western coast of Sicily for one of the greatest sea battles of all time. In the hostilities of the First Punic War, the Battle of the Agates Islands fought off the coast of Sicily it was a, a turning point. In the battle between two brilliantly engineered fleets, Carthage had the advantage in numbers. But their sleep killing machines were bloated with grain and supplies for Hamilcar's army, camped out on nearby Sicily. Many ships were sunk or lost or captured. People weren't expecting that. Now, the Carthaginians try to make a break for it, but they aren't able to do so because of this extra weight. That gives the Romans the victory. It was a strategic disaster. In the end, the Romans took nearly 30,000 Carthaginian prisoners. With no way of resupplying himself and his troops, Hamilcar was forced to surrender and retreat back to Carthage. It was clear the pendulum of power in the Mediterranean was now swinging ominously toward Rome. In victory, Rome gained not only Sicily, but also Carthage's holdings on Corsica, Sardinia, and the islands between Sicily and Africa. Hoping to cripple Carthage, Rome forced it to pay a large tribute. But Carthage was not ready to give up yet. It turned westward to Spain to generate new wealth. And the Carthaginians send Hamilcar Barca to Spain. So his goal in 237 is to conquer as much of Spain as possible. It took nine hard-fought years for Hamilcar to conquer the native tribes there. When he finally did, all of the land south of the Ebro River becomes part of the Carthaginian Empire. But Hamilcar paid for that conquest with his life. In 228 BC, he was killed in battle with a rebelling native tribe. Hamilcar's death in Spain was a great blow to Carthage, but it was by no means the end of Carthage. In fact, it opened the way for a whole new initiative. Legend has it that Hamilcar's nine-year-old son begged to watch his father lead Carthage into battle with Spain. And the father agreed on one condition, that the son would promise eternal hatred of Rome and commitment to that republic's defeat. And it was thus the son, named Hannibal, became the instrument of his father's revenge. And this was the first step on a path that would transform Hannibal into the most devastating foe that the Republic of Rome would ever face. In 1969, archaeologists discovered a sunken Punic warship with cannabis on board. It's thought the herb was brewed into a tea to calm rowers' nerves. 211 BC, a specter is haunting the Republic of Rome. Outside her walls, with an army poised to strike, is the man Romans fear and loathe above all, Hannibal, the great general of Carthage. Brilliant, brutal, Sophisticated, he is Rome's worst nightmare. As if by magic, Hannibal has penetrated Rome's defenses. But the magic is actually Hannibal's strategic genius and the use he makes of one of the world's greatest engineering corps. There's no doubt in my mind that Hannibal wasn't one of the greatest generals in history. 
I think demonstrably he is the greatest general in history. Hannibal's genius is born of a near religious zeal to destroy Rome, handed down to him by his father. In 221 BC, he was given the tools to do it. At the age of 26, he took command of the Carthaginian army. Hannibal was certainly Hamilcar's son. Uh, he was a crafty politician, a brilliant strategist and military man, but his real genius was in knowing when to use all of the great engineering developments that Carthage had at its disposal. As a commander of ironclad courage, he would launch one of the most stunning campaigns of aggression the world had ever seen. Rome had gained control of the Mediterranean, meaning Hannibal could not reach his enemy by sea. Driven to fulfill the vow he had made to his father to destroy Rome, Hannibal set out to do the impossible. He'd march over land, across the Alps, to the heart of the Roman Empire. Now, Hannibal knows he's greatly outnumbered. He knows he has a relatively small army in comparison to the Romans, but he does come up with a strategy which he believes will bring him victory. And what he has to do is take his army to Italy itself and attack the Romans on their home field. Hannibal set off in 218 BC with an army of 90,000 men, 12,000 horses, and 37 elephants acquired from African neighbors to the south. Elephants have been used in battle for centuries before this. They could be the turning point in a battle because the cavalry of the enemy could not withstand elephants. Therefore, Hannibal believes it's worth it to try to get these elephants to Italy. By October, they traveled more than 600 miles and came face to face with their first major obstacle, the raging Rhone River in France. Even at its narrowest, uh, shallowest time of the year, the Rhone River is still going to be somewhere between 100 to 150 to 200 meters wide. It's going to be daunting to all of Hannibal's field engineers. On the other side, a large number of Gauls were waiting to do battle. But the wall of water was a potentially deadly obstacle that had to be vanquished first. Hannibal's builders would have to conquer Mother Nature. Not only are the engineering feats daunting, but you also have crowds of insubordinate and hostile tribes waiting on the other side of the river. The solution would be one of Carthage's most spectacular feats of engineering, a series of giant rafts large enough to shuttle animals and supplies across the river in record time. These rafts were about 200 feet long and 50 feet wide. Now that means that you can't just use one single tree trunk. You have to also put multiple trees together and then lash those together too. This requires more than a Boy Scout knowledge of knots. With speed and efficiency, Hannibal's soldiers harvested massive conifers from the surrounding forests and connected the trees together with rope. One thing his engineers had to account for was the psyche of the elephants. So once the logs were bound together, the barges were piled high with a layer of sticks and a layer of earth so that the elephants would think they were on solid ground. When all was ready, Hannibal gave the signal to release the barges. The Gauls, startled by his boldness, were mystified when they saw the Carthaginian general leading his troops, cavalry, and elephants en masse across the turbulent Rhone. When he arrived at the river's opposite bank, the Gauls broke in panic and fled without striking a blow. The entire operation took a little more than nine days. I think the crossing of the Rhone in such a short space of time using rudimentary equipment is one of the great achievements of military history. And people slightly forget the small engineering miracles that made all this possible. Hannibal and his army continued on and made their way to the foot of the Alps. With winter looming, the troops were starving and exhausted. As they ascended, they confronted another seemingly impossible obstacle giant boulders. 
Hannibal's engineers devise a plan that would allow the troops not just to go over, but through. The stratagem of crossing the Alps certainly shocked the people of Italy. No one expected an army with elephants to make it across. And although the Alps may have seemed in places impassable, this idea of breaking up the mountains themselves to create a pathway to get your pachyderms across uh, was a brilliant idea. Now, how did Hannibal get his men, not to mention all those elephants, up, over, around, or through these giant boulders? Well, according to the Roman historian Livy, he came up with an ingenious plan along with his engineers that would literally move mountains. They cut big crevices through these boulders, and then they got wood from the surrounding forests. They'd wrap these boulders in the wood, and when the wind was right, they'd torch the wood. The rocks would heat up, and just when they were hot enough, they'd pour boiling vinegar into the crevices, which would shatter or melt the rocks such that these men could break them apart with iron implements. Now, what was Hannibal doing up in the Alps with all this vinegar? Well, if this is true, and we like to think it was, otherwise, how did he get across the Alps? It speaks volumes to the genius of this brilliant general. I'll tell you one thing. After navigating the snow of the Alps, the sight of the plains of northern Italy must have been very, very welcome. On August 2nd, 216 BC, near Cannae in southern Italy, Hannibal faced off against Roman forces under the command of Terentius Varro in a decisive conflict that would seal the fate of these two empires. As dawn breaks, Hannibal draws up a force of 50,000 men, newly strengthened with the help of hired mercenaries, against Varro's nearly 90,000 Romans. Varro decided to try and crush his opponent, sending a massive force to attack Hannibal's center. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. Anticipating Varro's strategy, Hannibal orders his cavalry to circumvent the Roman ranks from the rear. Hannibal had certainly done his homework in studying the psychology of his opponents. And he was able to trick them into his center, and then his forces could engulf them. Completely surrounded, the Romans were slaughtered where they stood. Only 3,500 Romans managed to escape. 10,000 were taken prisoner, and 70,000 were left dead on the battlefield. At the Battle of Cannae, the single greatest defeat ever inflicted on a Roman army throughout its entire history. And of course, we have to go to World War I to find a scale of slaughter as big. Cannae was a masterpiece of military strategy, but Hannibal was unable to capitalize on his string of victories. He fought on for another 13 years, mounting siege after siege on Rome and its surrounding cities. But ultimate victory remained elusive. He could defeat them in the field, but he lacked the proper weapons to take on the Roman capital. In 204 BC, Rome went on the offensive and launched an attack on Carthage. Hannibal finally returned home to muster its defense. In 204 BC, Scipio Africanus, who had already beaten the Carthaginians in Spain, convinced Rome to let him go around Hannibal altogether and attack Carthage directly. Hannibal was recalled to his city to defend it. Now, these two heavyweights met and spoke. We have no idea what they said to one another. It's lost to history. In 202 BC, they met again at the Battle of Zama. And Hannibal was defeated. And he was forced to surrender to an enemy that he'd spent his entire life trying to destroy. He would not fulfill his father's wishes. He was exiled from Carthage. And years later, in your present day Turkey, he committed suicide. Carthage's defeat at the end of the Second Punic War forces the empire to submit yet again to Roman terms. They are forced to surrender in 202 BC. The Romans again impose very harsh peace terms on the Carthaginians, meaning, first of all, they must again pay an indemnity, a tax to the Romans. Also, the Carthaginians 
lose their overseas territories, meaning their territory is now confined to areas just around Carthage itself. One last very important part of this treaty was that Carthage could not fight a war, any war, even a defensive war, without Rome's okay. With Carthage stripped of its military might, the field was now open for the Roman army to begin its unstoppable conquest of the ancient world. And their first major target would be the wounded city of Carthage. All that stood in the way was the ancient world's strongest fortifications. Hannibal ad portas, which translates to Hannibal is at the gates, was often used after the Second Punic War to scare children to bed. 150 BC, Marcus Porcius Cato, a Roman orator and the great-grandfather of Julius Caesar's famous enemy, walks the halls of the Roman Senate, but he is oblivious to his surroundings. For him, there is only one thing on his mind, Carthage. Cato was only too well aware of the strategic position of Carthage. He could see that as long as Carthage was an independent stronghold, it was too close to Sicily and Italy to be allowed to harass shipping or maintain a military presence. He wanted it completely wiped out. Now with Carthage, Carthage's one-time ally and neighbor, Numidia, starts to encroach on southern Carthaginian territory. Carthage feels obliged, and rightfully so, to defend itself, but there's a caveat. Since the Second Punic War, Carthage has promised Rome never to take up arms against anyone whatsoever without the consent of Rome. Rome sends a commission down to arbitrate this beef between Numidia and Carthage, and one of the deputies on that commission is Cato. And when Cato sees the prosperity with which Carthage has bounded back since the Second Punic War, he goes right back to Rome. He rails against the Senate that this prosperity means one thing and one thing only. Carthage is going to be at our doorstep with arms in no time. No matter what speech he makes, roads, politics, taxes, he always ends with ceterum sensio Carthaginum esse delenda, which means, furthermore, I say Carthage should be destroyed. Now, Carthage, feeling it's going to be annihilated, no help from Rome, takes up arms. Rome sends an army down to Carthage. Rome tells Carthage, you have to abandon and evacuate your city. Carthage refuses. Thus starts the Third Punic War. But now Rome has got a problem, because the strongest fortifications in all of antiquity at that time are the walls of Carthage. Today, time has reduced the fortress to its foundations. But in 149 BC, these protective walls were the city's last hope. It was a three-part wall system uh, with massive stone uh, circuit wall. It covered a huge extent and was thought to be unbeatable. A wonder of the world, those Carthaginian walls. And the Carthaginians trusted them. The wall had a circumference of 23 miles and a series of three protective layers. First, a ditch backed by a low wall packed with excavated soil, which would have been manned by a front line of soldiers who could withdraw quickly in the face of a major assault. The second wall was constructed of stone and dominated the outer defenses. Behind this second wall stood an even more impenetrable third wall, 45 feet in height and at least 30 feet wide. 15 towers were spaced at 200-yard intervals where watchmen stood guard. Inside this wall lived part of the Carthaginian army, including 20,000 men, uh, 300 elephants, who prepared for any type of attack that took place. The wall system surrounding Carthage made it the best fortified city in all of the Mediterranean, if not the world. And against the Romans, it would face its ultimate test, led by the fabled Carthaginian general, Hasdrubal. The Carthaginian commander who would lead the Carthaginians during the Third Punic War was a Hasdrubal. He is the one responsible for retaliating against the Numidians, and he is the guy who's going to be leading the main resistance. As the Roman legions descended on the city, the Carthaginians hurriedly scrambled to build a new defensive force. The women gave their hair up. They cut their hair so that they could make rope to fire the catapults. They emptied the prisons. The old men volunteered. 
people who hadn't been blacksmiths for 20 years said, I'll try again, and they rearmed themselves in an explosion of intent and determination that we really have to go to the siege by the Germans of Stalingrad to see again. In two months of frenzied work, they produced 6,000 shields, 18,000 swords, 30,000 spears, 120 ships, and 60,000 catapult missiles. Despite the arsenal Carthage had assembled, Rome had sent an overwhelming force. The city was alone, facing its own destruction. There was no area left alone without Rome or Roman allies with none of the colonies in a position to stand up to Rome. Carthage was left on her own. The city hunkered down behind its immense fortifications, hoping against all odds that their walls would repel the impending Roman invasion. Carthage held off the Roman attack for three years. And even in the last days after the Romans broke through the walls, it took seven days before they could get to the top of the citadel um, of moving through town like a juggernaut. The Roman siege squeezed the life out of the city from the outside. And eventually, although the immense land wall was never breached, the Romans managed to scale those at sea. Inside the city, the fighting continued street by street Few Carthaginian snipers were left, but they were so fierce that the Roman commander Scipio Aemilianus ordered the city to be set on fire and leveled. Thousands of Carthaginians were burned alive in the blaze. It was a firestorm. It must have been hellish for the residents, people fleeing. During its siege and capture, Carthage had been decimated. The city's population fell from 500,000 to 50,000. The survivors were sold as slaves, never to return home. It took just 17 days in the year 146 BC for Carthage to be completely destroyed by fire. That same year, Rome leveled Corinth, put Greece in their pocket, and overnight, the Mediterranean Sea became their own private lake. Carthage would rise again, albeit this time reconstructed by Rome, like this fantastic amphitheater here at El Jim. And by the third century AD, Carthage would thrive once more as a commercial port. But although undeniably Roman, the spirits and the voices of Dido and Anno the Navigator and Esdrubal and Hamilcar and Annibal would echo throughout those Roman walls, begging to be remembered for the remarkable achievements of their civilization. And if you listen well, you can still hear those voices whispering among the ruins that are Carthage. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller. <laughs>